and welcome back to the Donut County Board of Supervisors meeting. This is time for our regular session at 10 o'clock for Tuesday, October 24, 2017. I'd like to pause for a brief moment of reflection. Thank you. Supervisor Hemmingson, can you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Absolutely. Ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any new employees to introduce today? No? All right. County Council, any actions to report out of closed session? No reportable action. Thank you. And requests for any deletions, corrections, or additions from the board members to the agenda at this time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, several months ago, you established some two-by-two -two committees with uh, the city to discuss discussions, possible merging of services, law enforcement, and other related fields. So I was wondering when you plan to put that on the agenda for discussion on progress that's about five months ago. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and move forward with our consent agenda items comments from members of the public may be heard at this time regarding matters on the consent agenda only please try to limit your comments to three minutes or less it's for public comment on the consent agenda items correct public comment on the consent agenda items only Okay, seeing them, we'll bring it back to the board. Motion to approve. We have a motion. Second. Motion and a second. Kylie, can you please pull the vote? Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right, budget transfer items. So we have one on the agenda today, which is budget transfer item 10-01 the amount of $5,000 within the domestic violence budget to pay for quarterly domestic violence fees associated with the Del Norte County Agreement 97-167. Public comment. Move for approval. We have a motion. Second. And a second. Okay, no public comment. Bring it back to the board for a vote. Kylie, can you please pull the vote? Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Okay. And we do have a proclamation today I'd like to read at this time. This is a proclamation proclaiming gratitude and honoring all veterans on Veterans Day, November 11th, 2017. Whereas November 11th is nationally celebrated as Veterans Day, and whereas millions of veterans throughout the United States have fought for our country, and many of those lost their lives so that we might enjoy the freedoms that we have today. And whereas millions of veterans have suffered horrific physical wounds, disabilities, including mental and emotional issues affecting a life long hardship on them and their families and whereas veterans deserve the respect and honor this day only begins to give throughout the year and whereas the board of supervisors would like to acknowledge and honor all veterans for their past for their part in our fight for freedom now therefore the donut county board of supervisors proclaims its gratitude to those who have served in the armed forces on behalf of the united states of america during both peacetime and wartime be it further proclaimed that the Delnor County Board of Supervisors hereby encourages members of the community to participate in the November 11, 2017 Veterans Day activities as sponsored by local agencies and veterans organizations. Passed and adopted this day, the 
24th day of October 2017. Do we have anybody here who's willing to receive this on behalf of the veterans? Mr. Stevens? First of all, thank you very much. As a representative of both the VFW and of course a veteran, I appreciate it, we all appreciate it. And um, my wife and I were talking uh, just uh, this morning actually, we were watching the news and we were talking about how veterans are treated a lot better now than they were in the 60s and the 70s and to a certain extent the 80s. And uh, it's a nice trend to see and it's very appreciated. And so from everybody at the VFW and for all the veterans in this county, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Thank you. Look forward to seeing everybody at the parade. Let's go ahead and move forward with our scheduled item, which is our public comment period. Members of the public may address the board on matters which are within the jurisdiction of the board. If you are addressing the board regarding a matter listed on the agenda, you may be asked to hold your comments until the board takes up the matter. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Good morning, Supervisors. Good morning. I'm here before you today with concerns of Del Norte County financial health. September 26, uh, BOS meeting, Chair Howard nonchalantly mentioned Del Norte may have to increase property taxes or sales taxes. This is where I see um, mismanagement of funds, and that's probably not the right word, but currently there are 10 lawsuits Del Norte County is involved in. Two of them are ridiculous. One is for a dog. Uh, for a $75 uh, dollar dog ticket, uh, which uh, they're fighting because their dog was labeled as vicious and Del Norte County ordinance is not the same as state ordinance. Um, the second one is over a homeless woman, Alice Brown. These are things that could have been probably swept under the rug and taken care of other than, you know, let's been thousands of dollars of taxpayers money on defending the case instead of to save $75 uh, we pay $400,000 a year for the airport when the border coast regional airport is supposed to pay for it uh, uh, super you supervisors spend $35,000 a year for your CSAC and other uh, outside entities which I think you should invest in a van so that you all can Right in the van, county-owned van, and save some money instead of paying each one of you individually. We need to trim the fat somewhere. Um, each one of you receive $150 every six months for inspecting the roads. Our roads are in great disrepair. Uh, filling a pothole with gravel on Roy Street is not my idea of getting the job done. And also, there's a sinkhole forming on LeClaire. In the meantime, more and more economic blight is noticeable when you walk into the stores downtown, mode is prevalent, and no code enforcement to control any of those issues. And then you all ponder on why no one wants to come up here and live. I'm here before you to tell you, I will not support an increase in property tax, nor will I support sales tax increase for mismanagement of funds. This continued abuse of spending taxpayer money will eventually hurt all employees when you file for bankruptcy. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Public comment. Please. Good morning. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Benita Cabrera, and I'm here uh, representing Seroptimus, excuse me, <coughs> International of Crescent City. And we are continuing to educate our community about sex trafficking, the sex trafficking that happens of children and women and men as well. Um, this issue is happening in all of our communities as I've come and spoke about before. And uh, last October we did a movie about a young girl from Nepal that was trafficked. Um, Supervisor Gitlin uh, came to that viewing. I appreciate his presence. Um, but this year we're doing a viewing of a, of a documentary about um, some moms who rescued their middle school daughters from being sex trafficked. 
They went on the site that the girls were being trafficked on and they bought their daughters back. So once they um, encountered their daughters, they rescued them. Um, to imagine being the mother who had to go through all of those sex ads to find their daughter is heartbreaking. Well, these moms were really fed up with knowing that Backpage is trafficking children on the internet. So they took Backpage to court to sue them to prevent them from trafficking anyone else's children in that manner. Unfortunately, there's a law that protects Backpage 100% because they can't be held accountable for anything that someone else puts on their site. The law was written in 91 or 92. It's certainly outdated. It wasn't intended to protect people from trafficking children on the internet. It was actually written for the exact opposite reason. But um, I'm a lay person, so I don't really understand why it protects um, all of these servers. So every time Congress tries to make a change to that law, Google, Facebook, all of the other providers are um, putting a lot of pressure on Congress not to make that law change because it will affect their business as well. And so this documentary talks about the court cases. It talks about the mothers and their children. It does not depict the sex acts that happened to the girls. It, it just mainly specifically talks about the lawsuits that parents have waged against Backpage and lost every single time. And I'm looking to you as our um, leaders to find a way to help make that law be changed. So I'm, I'm here to invite you to a viewing the second Tuesday of the month of November at Family Resource Center, and I, I put some flyers um, over there. So please come. I'm inviting the Board of Supervisors, the City Council, um, some of the boards, uh, local boards, board members, um, like the Family Resource Center Board and such, because we um, can come and talk about it, but we really need our leaders to, to step up and say, wait, no more trafficking children for sex. And, and we call it trafficking children for sex, but let's be real. Men are raping children in motel rooms, in houses, um, in the woods. Women and children are being trafficked for drugs, for money, for a place to live and it has to stop and we can't let the internet traffic our children anymore thank you can i clarify with you yes. november 10th is that correct uh october 10th we did one okay so the second tuesday of november i don't have my calendar okay. in front of me but whatever the second two it'll be the second tuesday of every month so the 14th of november. the 14th of november thank you okay thank you very much mr chairman uh Benita, just, just come, on, come on back just for a moment First of all, I want to commend you for your <clears throat> exemplary work that you're doing. It's hard work. I did attend that Stark showing. It was it was eye-opening, and I hope all of the our, our board will eventually come to this next one you're doing. Uh, what can we do actively? I know passively I support everything you do, but what can we do actively? Do you think this should be a, a resolution of sort? We send on to Sacramento through our our state elected representatives um, see something say something is that something that we can do uh, encourage our public to see uh, if they see something that doesn't look right with a an adult with an out-of-place child or uh, something that doesn't look right what's your suggestion that we can actively participate in well currently um, the flyer that I handed out has uh, website it's called I am Jane Doe film .com, and it's it's on your paper just below the picture and if folks will go on there they can learn about the law and how we can change it that's the biggest thing because if we can't change the law we can't stop the traffic on the internet and that's the main way that children are being sex trafficked right now um, as far as locally what we can do is continue to educate the people that we are with that we are coming contact with so c currently, we continue to educate hotel and motel employees because they're the front line. They're the place that the, the sex trafficking is happening under their noses. And if they don't know what it looks like, how can they report it? 
And so once we can educate them just a little bit, it will pique their interest in noticing and learning more and finding out more and in talking about trafficking. So what I can say we can do, yes, we could do a, a, a see something, say something campaign. Seroptimus is happy to, to put the word out and talk about however we think that we can make a difference in our community. Um, but I think if, um, if we continue to talk about it, then it'll be less and less prevalent in our community because people will know more about what they see and how to di identify it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Anything you. else? Supervisor. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you. Appreciate your attention to this issue. Okay, public comment. Good morning. Good morning, board. My name is Greg Bianchi. I'd like to add a little comment to what this young lady just shared with all of you. I think we should think about maybe sending a letter to our congressmen and let them know how we feel as uh, parents and uh, people of, of good standing and uh, address the issue that she brought forward. I'm sure there's a lot of commercials on TV. I've seen a few uh, talking about the uh, shows a guy walking into a liquor store, walking out, and then there's this young lady on the side there and uh, she's either being prostituted or whatever. Uh, it kind of leaves you with the idea that what do you do in that case? How do you report it? Do you call the local officials? Do you call the police? Who do you contact to say, I think I suspect this young lady's on the street for uh, something other than just being there waiting for a cab or something, you know, or waiting for Uber to pick her up? Uh, how do you approach somebody? If you find someone in that kind of situation, do you walk up to them and without the, causing them to become Ill, you know, leery of your presence there as well? and think what you're there for, you know? Are you there for to ask her or to see if they're actually there under those conditions? Do they need help? Because, <clears throat> I mean, today you approach anybody and they get kind of leery about what your intent is, you know? Usually I start gabbing before I walk up to someone to let them know I'm coming and maybe I just want to engage in a conversation with them about something. Uh, maybe they need, I need some information from them. But when you got people, children, especially on the internet, a lot of times they're vulnerable. They have no idea what's going on. And maybe they are enticed by something. Maybe they're lured in by some other means. And that's what brings them in to the internet. And well, the internet is pretty broad. It's out there for everybody. I mean, people put a lot of stuff on Facebook. <laughs> I must say it's quite, uh, uh, <clears throat> I would say uh, it's not to my liking. I'll say it that way. Uh, but uh, with the internet being the way it is, it's, it needs some upgrades and needs some sort of uh, law that says that you can't do certain things on the internet. But if we don't do something, and I was thinking maybe we should send a letter to a congressman and say, you know what, is there anything you can do? Is there any legislation that can be brought forward on this? Uh, maybe we need to start in our own community and think about maybe we should start here. So I advise you, if you can, put together a letter, send it to our congressman, and let them know how we feel about such an issue, and maybe we can take it from there. Thank you very much. Have Thanks for your time and your comments. Public comment. Good morning. Good morning. Susan Doherty, and I'm speaking as a seroptimist. I just wanted to follow up on what Benita said. When you're wanting to know what can you do, the very first step is to come and see this movie. It is um, a really different movie than the one that we saw last year, that we showed last year. This one has so much to do with the legalities and the protections that are happening on the internet, where so, such a huge amount of this stems from. And the movie is exciting in that it is a call to action. You don't sit there and go, gosh, what do I do now? You come out feeling like there are people you can work with, there are letters to be written, and we do have members of Congress that are working on this uh, law that protects internet postings. And so it's easy. The very first step is educate yourself, and if you could start by coming to see this movie that will be run the second Tuesday of every month as long as we can run it, um, that would be an excellent first start, and then come together as a unit to you know, see where you want to go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Public comment. 
Good morning. Hi, Eileen Cooper. I don't know if I have the endurance to go to the item. So um, the public lands pass. Um, I think we might be on the same page on this. Um, it seems to me that this raises a lot of um, coastal isu access issues, um, designated coastal access throughout the fish and uh, wildlife lands. And it's a complex um, mosaic of private land, pub uh, fish and wildlife land, and state park land. Um, a lot of times people enter at the state park area and end up in the wildlife area or um, vice versa. And um, I, I really think this is um, a very complex coastal access issue um, that needs um, scrutiny. So uh, I support um, this blanket approval for this um, land pass plan. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Public comment. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for those comments. We'll bring it back to the board for our 1015 timed agenda item, which is a presentation by a regional council of rural counties. An introductory presentation. Great for you to be here with us today, Justin. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Howard, supervisors. Uh, my name is Justin Caparuso. I'm with the Rural County Representatives of California in Sacramento. Um, our previous name, Regional Council of Rural Counties, we changed a few years back just to um, kind of reflect our membership base. We represent 35 of the 58 counties in the state. And I'm here today just to provide kind of an overview of our organization. Supervisor Hemmingson sits on our board of directors and has asked us to come up and um, remind you kind of of our organization and what it is that we do. So my presentation will be um, happy to discuss and answer questions during or afterward to the best of my ability. Oh, this is mine here. So at the end of last year, we um, had a little bit of an organizational change um, in the way that the leadership, um, uh, the executive leadership was in our organization. Currently our um, president and CEO is Greg Norton, who's been there for about 17 years. And then we've now got a, um, three vice presidents who serve under Greg. Paul Smith, who's our vice president of governmental affairs. Myself, um, in charge of external affairs. And then Craig Ferguson is business operations, who handles all the business side, um, our revenue generating organization. And Lisa McCarger is our CFO or our controller. So as I mentioned, we have 35 member counties. We represent 3.7 million residents. Uh, the geography of our member counties uh, includes forests, mountains, deserts, coastal areas, farm, ranch land, vineyards. Um, more than half of the, the land mass and two thirds of the state's forests reside in our member counties. And more than 70% of US Forest Service land um, and 75% of California's available water are in the counties in which we represent, as you all are aware. One of our revenue generating organizations that falls under the rural county umbrella is called Golden State Finance Authority, or GSFA. Um, Golden State Finance Authority is a, um, uh, serves to assist low to moderate income and minority home buyers and provides consistent source of financing for those without resources for down payment and closing costs. So some of the programs include the GSFA Platinum, which is a down payment assistance program, mortgage credit certificates, and energy efficiency financing um, and PACE programming. Thanks to programs like um, Golden State Finance Authority, over the last few years we have had the privilege of being able to um, have resources to be able to give back to the communities and the um, counties in which we operate. Um, we've done that through what we call three give back programs, and this is very timely actually hearing about the human trafficking. Um, the first is a veterans housing program. Um, we assisted the completion of a 12 unit homeless veterans housing program in Sacramento County that serves the surrounding counties. Um, that uh, we moved the first eight residents in, in, in before Christmas last year and they're finalizing the third building um, at the end of this year as well. So there'll be 12 units with two bedrooms that could possibly serve 24 um, homeless veterans in Sacramento. The second is a human trafficking education program that we developed called PROTECT. And we, this program 
is in working with, we're simply the funders of this program. We were able to bring it to life. We worked with the Department of Education, the Attorney General's Office, and three nonprofits known as um, Three Strands Global, uh, the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, and Love Never Fails. And Protect is a um, education and prevention program, and it's working with fifth, seventh, ninth, and 11th grade curriculum and developing, um, the curriculum, curriculum has been developed to, you know, in fifth grade it starts with safe people, safe places. And so it's, it's a way of integrating um, human trafficking at each of those grade levels. 11th grade, it gets really into it um, and explains the problem and, and really kind of try to arm our students so that they understand that this is a huge problem out there and how to avoid it and how to, how to note it, as we were talking about earlier. Um, the rollout for your county is scheduled for the 2018-19 school year, and so I know that um, Protect has already been in touch with Superintendent Harris and is working on getting people on board, getting teachers on board um, over the summer, I believe. The third give back program um, is also very timely, emergency disaster assistance. Um, as we're all aware, wildfires have been ravaging our state for the past decade and it's been one of our main priorities in terms of um, federal funding and, and the reallocation of how fire prevention is funded and, and fire suppression is funded. Um, over the past few years, we've provided financial resources to help Butte, um, Calaveras County, the Butte Fire, and Lake County, the Valley Fire, in their rebuild efforts and their temporary shelters and assistance. Um, we're obviously now in the point of looking at doing the same for the um, counties that have been uh, impacted over the last couple of weeks with the fires going on right now. This video um, is just a couple minutes long, and it's, it, we just produced it. You're the first county to actually see it. We did run it at our annual meeting, which was held in September. Um, but this kind of gives an overview of the, of the programs.
So it's quite sad watching this knowing that it was just produced a couple months ago and it's already outdated with those fires and we're already on to the next round. But it um, gives you kind of an overview of what it is that we're working on now in terms of our give back programs. All right, then the main focus for RCRC. So RCRC provides legislative and regulatory advocacy services for our member counties. Um, there's other organizations who do legislative. Uh, we are one of the only who does regulatory as well. So we'd have two lobbyists who work specifically on the regulatory side of things for us. Um, we fight for local funding. We preserve the quality of life in rural California. We steward California's natural resources, rally against inequitable regulations, protect local control and support local economies. This last bullet is interesting because we've also, um, in the process of, over the last year, um, opened a, an economic development arm in our organization as well that's focused on really looking at driving economic opportunity to our member counties. Um, and we should have more to report on that, hopefully, in the, in the coming year. Our legislative and regulatory um, priorities are, kind of, are set by a set of policy principles that the board adopts each year. So we work at the direction of our board of directors in terms of um, issues and um, legislation that we move forward with. So while we track and we um, follow quite a bit, as you can imagine in Sacramento, there are certain um, priorities that rise to the top for us. And these are some of the, those for this um, year and then the coming year. Disadvantaged communities is one of them. Uh, just the definition of what a disadvantaged community is and how a tool is being used, Cal and Viro screen, is a very large um, issue for us. It excludes nearly all of our counties from being disadvantaged, which doesn't make much sense to us. So we've been working really diligently to get the definition of that changed, even in small pieces of legislation that may not even be of interest to us necessarily. State PILT is an ongoing um, budgetary funding issue that we're dealing with. Um, I'm sure everybody's aware of kind of where we're at with state PILT. Local marijuana taxes, multi-county assessment appeals boards um, was a big one for us this year. The IHSS cost shift, we've actually worked with um, an outside council or an outside um, contract firm as well on this because it's gonna, it was such a big deal for us this year. Forest management, wildfire funding, and tree mortality um, is one of the ones I'm involved in the most. I'm on the uh, external affairs side, not the legislative side necessarily, but we get involved in that nationally and it's uh, obviously a very big deal. And then the state budget priorities are always fun each year for us to kind of protect. This slide's a little difficult to see, um, but I thought I would go through, just touch on these briefly. These are some of the key legislative packages that um, we were working on this year that I think are of importance. Assembly, Assembly Bill 1250 um, is a, would establish specific and restrictive standards for the use of personal services contracts by counties. This is, um, our CRC is opposed to this. CSAC, our sister organization, is opposed to this. We've worked diligently. It's currently, um, awaiting consideration of the Senate Rules Committee, so it's, it's been held, um, but it, it will come back this next year. Senate Bill 649 um, requires the leasing, required the leasing of public property to telecommunication providers for the placement of small cell wireless facilities, which would be about the size of a, of a refrigerator, um, at a leasing rate that was capped by the legislature and subject only to ministerial permitting processes, so it would have removed um, any sort of local control over that. Um, uh, SB 649 was an all hands on deck sort of um, legislative campaign with, that we rolled out in terms of media, um, advocacy. It was um, luckily, I mean, it sort of flew through the legislature, but it was uh, vetoed by the governor uh, a couple weeks ago. So that's a win. RCRC was obviously opposed, CSAC, League of Cities, um, a lot of other organizations. Uh, Senate Bill 1. Uh, in March 2017, the legislature and the governor enacted a transportation funding package, which was to provide additional monies for maintaining the existing road and highway infrastructure. Um, RCRC went to the board for this, and the board uh, chose a support position. This has been signed into law by the governor, and now we're working to on the allocation of that funding for the counties. Cannabis regulatory structure. Um, I'm going to. That's a, obviously an ongoing big issue for us as well as CSAC. There's two recently enacted bills that unify the medical and the adult use scheme to achieve a single regulatory structure. Um, we initially were opposed to this first effort. 
However, they re we removed our opposition due to some productive discussions with the administration. And we've been assured that local government concerns regarding revisions um, to the state verification of the approval process will be addressed in the emergency regulations that are being um, put together this fall. Cap and trade, the cap and trade expenditure plan. So the legislature this year enacted an extension to the state's cap and trade auction program. Our organization doesn't have a position on, didn't have a position on cap and trade um, overall. But of importance to our member counties, there were three key items that we were looking for in this program. And the two of the three came to fruition for us. One being the elimination of the state responsibility area fee through 2030. So it's eliminated through 2030, but it's technically eliminated completely. It's just the way that it's worded it has to be kind of a little weird that way. Um, the cap and trade expenditure plan appropriates $200 million in funding for healthy forest programs to alleviate wildfire risk and aid in tree mortality mitigation, which is huge for us. Um, and at least 10% of that must be used for local government assistance grants. Um, the third, uh, the plan appropriates $40 million in funding to Cal Recycle for organics diversions programs, which um, I can explain a little bit later why and where that falls in for RCRC. The fourth um, kind of pillar that we were interested in that did not happen is um, the modified definition of a disadvantaged community. And so we're working on that, as I explained, in several different legislative platforms. That did not happen there. So the benefits of RCRC membership. Um, RCRC, as I had mentioned, we have 35 members. Our board is a 35-member board. We meet about seven times a year. Um, the benefits for the counties involved have access to a knowledgeable and highly effective GA team. We have decades of combined legislative and regulatory experience, both here and in DC. We employ a contract firm in Washington, DC, and are back there ourselves several times a year to fight for um, federal dollars and federal um, legislative priorities. Uh, we track over 1,400 bills this last year, and dozens of regulatory proposals are monitored. And so it's, we're really trying to make sure that um, you know, in addition to kind of maintaining where we're at with our membership and maintaining where um, our rural counties are in terms of um, benefits from the state that we're not letting anything else slip through the cracks as well. The external affairs piece. So some of the ways that, that um, we can provide resources to our members and to um, members of the public as well, constituents here. Uh, our website, rcrcnet.org, is a great platform for, and it's updated continually, but it's a great platform for information on what's going on in Sacramento and D.C. as it impacts rural counties. We have a weekly newsletter called The Barbed Wire. It comes out Friday. That's electronic as well. Um, and that provides up-to-date information um, on not only legislation and regulatory packages, but just other things that are happening in, in and around the state. Of course, we have social media that we're updating continually. Um, and then we do our own earned media outreach as well, utilizing our board members and being strategic with sort of placement on um, those op-ed pieces and press in uh, letters to the editors. One of the other um, affiliates that we have under the RCRC umbrella is the Environmental Services Joint Powers Authority, of which Del Norte is a member. And it was formed in 1993, and it is, we have 23 rural member counties of the 35 that are members now. And it's uh, an organization that really combines all of our solid waste um, uh, efforts into one. So they have five board meetings per year, um, offers opportunity to have state regulatory staff and industry leaders give presentations on current issues. It really gives us a voice um, in the capital for the uh, rural issues as they relate to solid waste. Uh, this is run by Mary Pitto in our office, who's been doing it for several years and does a great job. And this um, organization just continues to grow too as we see um, the needs increase. So that's, that concludes my presentation. I have, I, I'm available to answer questions to the best of my ability. Um, but I do thank you all for your time today. It's great coming up. It's beautiful. Um, I was outside taking pictures earlier, so you should see some of those online at some point. Great. Thank you, Justin. We'll go ahead and open it for conversation and comments from the board. If I could. Please, absolutely. Yeah, Justin, thank you so much for uh, for coming did an absolutely uh, wonderful job of get, uh, giving an outline of, uh, of what they do. There's a lot of stuff going on and uh, uh, like the barbed wire, I know I get that. It's very irritating. <laughs> um, it's very informative. So that's a very nice piece of it. The bad piece of it is it's very informative. Right. So you get the, 
you get to know what is going on and what isn't going on. Um, all those things are great. I just wanted to touch uh, on a couple of things. Um, the PROTECT uh, yes. program, um, I, I don't think was mentioned that there is an educational component to the instructors, to the teachers, uh, as I remember in the presentation that we had uh, down there, where they um, try to uh, identify at-risk kids, the kids that, uh, that may be more susceptible than other kids to, to that uh, uh, sex trafficking, uh, uh, the internet uh, sex trafficking um, problem. So I just think that's, that's part of that 18, 19 rollout. Correct, yeah, so they're part of the, when the instructors are, um, we roll out the in, uh, curriculum to the instructors, that is something that they go through as well. They all ch can choose to opt in or opt out of um, participating because it's a sensitive subject and, right. and that, the org Protect recognizes that. But there is that um, education piece for them as well to be able to spot and identify kind of triggers for human trafficking. Um, that's... Uh that's about all the questions I have. I think, uh, I think you're truly, uh, I think the organization from Delmar County standpoint is, is uh, way under utilizing the resource that we have there. Um, it's open to, open to uh, uh, our staff and other supervisors uh, to get help. And I would urge all of us and uh, all of our uh, department heads to utilize uh, um, their services more. Thank so you, Supervisor. That. Appreciate it, Supervisor Berkowitz. Thank you, Justin, for being here today. Uh, I noticed that uh, on S1027, which is the uh, Secure Rural Schools Bill in the Senate, uh, Senator Feinstein has signed on as a co-sponsor of this bill, but Senator Harris has not. And I'm wondering what RCRC is doing to be able to convince Senator Harris to sign on as a co-sponsor. So on SRS, we've been talking, this has been sort of day by day, as you are aware. Um, on the federal front, we've been talking about, uh, there has been identified an offset for authorizing and funding it for two years that we've been hearing about, um, but it hasn't been made public yet. So we don't know where we're currently at with that. I don't know what Paul's done in terms of Harris in general, but I can find that out for you and get back to you. Yeah. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Gitlin. Justin, thanks for, for coming and making a great presentation. Uh, I've spoken with legal department at uh, RCRC before about uh, the lack of voice in Sacramento in the Assembly and the Senate. I think uh, the latest count I had is in Los, uh, of the 80 members of the Assembly, uh, 23 reside in Los Angeles County alone, and in the 40 members of the Senate, uh, 11 reside in Los Angeles County alone. Uh, the voice of... Uh, Rural California is sometimes shrill and not heard. And uh, this was changed uh, some 50 years ago in a civil rights case, as you're aware of. Is there an appetite in the, the Supreme Court to have that case reviewed again, to look to see that at least the upper house of, this, uh, of our state government, the Senate, can be apportioned a more uh, akin to how the United States Senate is apportioned, rather than by population for both uh, the Assembly and the House? Uh, and the Assembly and the Senate, I should say. Uh, w much of this drives the argument of State of Jefferson, which in many right. of our counties has been uh, very loud because they feel they do not have representation in rural California. So is this a possibility that can be reviewed in the future uh, at the Supreme Court level of the United States to see about how our seats are apportioned uh, at the state and Senate level? Yeah, I definitely think that, um, as we all know, there's been several movements um, recently that have really kind of um, highlighted that desire within our state. So I do see that at some point it will be addressed to some level. To the extent of where it goes, I couldn't tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Cowan. I don't have any questions for you, Justin. I just want to say thanks for coming out. Um, I appreciate all that you guys do. Uh, in September, I was very uh, prevalent of, of just how much you guys do, and I, I'm really excited about the Protect program starting here um, in the fall with our kids. I think that's going to be a huge um, thing for our kids here. So thanks for coming up. Thank you. And definitely thank you again, Justin. I, the It's very rare 
when RCRC does not represent the interests of Delnar County and as Supervisor Hemmingson has spoken to, um, when, when our counties can agree on something and provide that leverage to both the Assembly and the State Senate and up to the governor's level, these are priorities for rural. RCRC is really always there to back us. And this is hugely important for us. As you know, Delnar County is small. Our voice is fairly limited. But when combined with other rural communities, as Supervisor Hemmings has mentioned, we've got a powerful stick to wave down there that says, hey, listen to us. And it reflects back on what Supervisor Gitlin has alluded to, is that oftentimes representation is not heard up here in the northern part of the state. And with your weight and that lobby down there, I definitely feel the value that we're getting from RCRC is not only well worth it, it needs to continue long into the future. And we definitely have, and we'll continue to have a voice with you. Um, to highlight some of your recent comments um, that have affected uh, farmers in Donut County and has been brought to my attention by the Donut County Farm Bureau and then also the Resource Conservation District. And it has directly to do with the dis disadvantaged communities. As you're aware, the California Department of Force, uh, uh, um, California Department of Food and Agriculture, and also the California Air Resources Board, through their grants program this year, has offered both the Building Healthy Soils program and alternative manure management programs. In that, in those grant programs that many of our local farmers wanted to take advantage of this year, that disadvantaged community language is there in the grant, which significant points were awarded to farmers that were in these disadvantaged right. areas. It is absolutely crazy when Delnar County, that is no question one of these disadvantaged communities, does not even qualify for the points awarded in that language. I would love RCRC to continue this push. I'd love Supervisor Hemmingson to continue this push with RCRC and making sure that language is changed down the road. So Delnar County, which is truly a disadvantaged community in the scheme of things, is able to participate. And I'm not sure why they've done this, but we'll be talking to our senator about it on Thursday also when he's here to speak with this community. Yeah, thank you. I, I, this has been, um, we've developed our own language that we've been shopping around. We've received a lot of interest from um, coalition members, other organizations. And so it's, it's moving, um, you know, being included anywhere so far now, but we're definitely kind of keeping that at the top of our priority, priority list. It makes no sense to us. We'll keep up the pressure. Thank you. Absolutely. So I'm going to open it up for public comment real quick, just in case members of our community want to okay. say something for you to take back to Sacramento. Please. We might ask you to return to the podium, okay. Justin. Good morning. Good morning, Victoria Dickey, Bob Berkowitz District. Um, is your name pronounced Caparuso? Gorgeous. Good job. Gorgeous. Anyway, um, I have one question. Uh, recently, the fire tax has been suspended. That doesn't put the money back in our pocket. I'm wondering if this group can do any kind of uh, punching and poking to get that on an agenda. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, do, we'll address that in just a minute with Justin. Pardon? We'll address that in just a minute with Justin. We'll bring him back up here to. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, um, that's a lot of money. It sure you know, is. and what we got was the um, ability to go to the website that everybody else in the world can go to because it's a website. I called them and I asked them and I asked them what the penalties were if I didn't pay it. It was like 11 cents. Um, but I plan to send them a bill, and I think everybody should, for the amount of money that we have put out and. The penalties are listed on the top of the uh, program, and if not, you can always call and ask. But, you know, those of us who have property in the county, we reside here. Um, we have been singled out as having some particular, I don't know why we had the tax, but we got singled out. and. I didn't ever see anybody stand up and say what, um, and and I'd like to see us, you know, protected. It, it all starts with us. I, I mean, there's a few things that we should be doing. One is we shouldn't be allowing them to call us a sanctuary county um, because that's against the federal law, and. Um, 
it's going to have repercussions. I mean, I hate to be so blunt, but if you're in a room with three people and, you know, um, two of them are against you and one isn't, that's, that's the one who's going to get the money is the one who isn't. Well, Trump's the one with the money. And, uh, you know, I think that this group, your group, whoever should, on behalf of those of us in this county, write a letter and I, I'm hoping he can do it because he has more clout than our group. Um, but that's just a couple of the thoughts that I have. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hi, I'm Good morning Cooper. again. Good morning. Um, I had a, a question about um, how the this RC RC um, is uh, responding to um, the big water project that the governor is pushing to grab Northern River waters. Um, it seems that affects a lot of rural communities, um, and the Trinity is one of them. Um, and it, it, from an environmental standpoint, it, this is a uh, horrendous water grab um, with devastating impacts to fisheries in the um, north and rural areas. And um, what, is this too conflicted of an issue, or what have you done with regard to this? Thank you. Additional public comment. Okay, we'll bring it back to the board. And Justin, please join us again. And maybe Supervisor Hemmings, you can weigh in if you yeah, want. Yeah, actually, I can weigh in just before uh, Justin, if it's okay, uh, um, addressing uh, Ms. Dickey's uh, comments. Uh, this board did stand up against uh, the uh, SR, uh, S, uh, SRA fee uh, when it first came out. Um, and we sent numerous letters opposing that uh, and had um, forms that you could file along with your payment uh, to uh, in protest. Um, so we, we did address that when it very first came out. Um, the, uh, um, the other thing about getting, I kind of got laughed at this a little bit when I asked for our, I asked if there was this cap and trade, uh, the cap and trade uh, bill uh, uh, was going to stop would stop the fee from going and I said well what are the chances of us getting our money back and they kind of laughed at me so um, I didn't get very far with that but Justin I'll let you take over from there um, yeah just to kind of echo your comments we had been um, attacking this fee since day one so we were very happy when um, we found it in this package to be eliminated at the end of the, the term as for the reimbursements we haven't really discussed where to go with that I do think that um, there's a case to be made for sort of a public um, a public relations campaign about it. I just don't know that I would get my hopes up and that it's going to happen. So that's where I would be with the fire tax reimbursements. For the water projects um, are, were, as I mentioned earlier, we're board driven. So we have 35 members and we um, advocate on issues that the board um, has agreement upon. So a lot of the water related issues at this point, north, south state, um, the board does not come to an agreement on, so we do, we do not wade into those issues, no pun intended, with a lot of those. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chairman Hard. Hard. Supervisor Berkowitz. Thank you. Uh, I think this started in 2012, the, what I call the illegal fire tax. And the uh, Jarvis campaign basically has been working on this. In fact, uh, they have sued uh, for the back payments now, of course, we're not going to be paying this going forward until 2030. Then those payments may be instituted again. So my question to you is, can we get RCRC to join the Jarvis campaign and this lawsuit against the state uh, for this illegal fire tax? And once we do that and we're successful, then we should be able to get that money that we've paid in since 2012 back again. So what do you think? So just to clarify, the 2030 date is the end of the um, SRA fee. So the SRA fee program ran until 2030, runs until 2030. So the date that they used for the cap and trade program 
is the end of the fee, so there will be no fee again. So it's a little bit wonky in terms of the language. Um, the lawsuit itself, I know a lot of the money's been collected and been held onto um, in, in an effort to fight that lawsuit, which is another reason why I feel like there's no chance that it's gonna be coming back. Um, we've worked with Howard Jarvis and we spread their message and, 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 and have joined in them as, with them as well in this um, campaign against it. Um, I just don't know where we would be at with it now. What you're really saying here is the money that we have paid in is now going to attorney yes. fees to fight the Jar Jarvis campaign to it's get our being, money back. It's being held, correct. Doesn't make sense to me, but that's the way it is. Yep. Further questions from the board? Justin, thank you again. We'll continue sending Mr. Hemmingson down to join you. We appreciate He'll that. He'll be a great voice. Thank you very CMC. much. Appreciate it. I will leave these. Um, there's just some marketing materials I'll leave for the five of you as well. Thank you. Excellent. Enjoy a beautiful day in Dillard County. And spend lots of money, please. <laughs> All right. We're going to go ahead and move to our 1025 timed agenda item, which is a presentation from the Office of Emergency Services. And Miss Cindy Henderson. Good day, Cindy. I've also really? asked Commander Stevens to come up with me too. That's awesome. <laughs> You're back up here. <laughs> okay. So as it was said, we're here to do just a little bit of update on Office of Emergency Services and what we've been doing. And the big, biggest thing that we've been doing is we've got chosen to go to the Integrated Emergency Management course in Emmitsburg, Maryland, which was a very exciting time for Del Mar County. So this is a grant funded training program that you have to apply for and you get accepted for. I started applying five years ago. Every year we got letters of support. This last year we actually asked the state to jump in and help us a little bit. So Cal OES was very helpful in getting us selected for this. Once you're selected, it is a complete grant funded program. So um, it didn't cost us anything to travel. And so they reimbursed us for travel, transportation, housing, the meals were served at the center. We, were, we had the ability to go to the center and it was put on by, for us by them. So it was a disaster it was happening in Del Norte County. So I started planning this about almost a year ago, working with them exactly what we wanted to see covered, exactly how it works in Del Norte County. They brought a disaster to us, and this one was a flood situation, which was a really perfect opportunity for us. So we had the ability to take 75 people with us. We took 49 by the time the whole thing was pushed out. Um, we had people, amazing people that went with us. From Del Norte County, we had IT represented, OES represented, Del Norte Sheriff's Office, Recreation, DHHS, CDD, Auditor, Ag Department, on and on and on. City of Crescent City, Finance, Public Works, Administration, just lots of different departments. Sutter Coast Hospital, Del Norte High School, uh, Crescent City Harbor District, the Humboldt State University. We actually brought NOAA from Humboldt County with us. Smith River Fire, Crescent City Fire Rescue, lots and lots of volunteers, which was amazing. We had 18, so over a third of the population that went with us were volunteering their time and not getting paid to be there. So that was amazing. So we had the community emergency response, response teams. We had disaster animal response teams. We had ham radios. We had American Red Cross. And the volunteers went on and on and on. So this was an amazing opportunity. And it went for four days, eight to five, training, training, training for us. So some of the trainings that we looked at is, and we had experts, what's amazing is we had an expert there for every section of the emergency operational center. And then we handpicked what threats that we wanted to talk about and what kind of things that we had gaps in in Delmar County that we wanted assistance with with these experts. And they came from all over the United States to assist us. So flood management threats was huge. We wanted resource management for small communities, EOC activation activities, public, public information, damage assessment, volunteer management, documentations recovery, critical incident stress debriefing, just lots and lots of activities. And every time that we had an activity, we would, we would then exercise it and activate our emergency operational center and do testing together and work on there. Some of the highlights, and I put a lot of pictures in here because the pictures really tell the story. So this was a chance for others to step up and take the lead, which was amazing. You see Commander Stevens up there with our PIO, and he's going to talk a little bit about the PIO training that was dug, done, the public information. 
But what was amazing for us is we, were, we allowed people to step back and their seconds to step up and take the lead. So, you know, Commander Stevens is always our public information for Del Norte County. Well, we actually had him step back a little bit and he mentored Charlie Haynes from um, the Harbor District to do some PIO training, which he's got a really strong background in it. So we allowed Eric Weir to step back and we had Jason Borges step up and do the public work. So it was amazing is where we had the ability to actually stand back. So Deborah Wakefield went with me. I stood back, mentored her a little bit along with one of the experts and she stepped up for office emergency services. So it was an amazing ability for us to have the experts next to us ask questions and fill us in and actually do that hands-on training um, the design the exercise were designed for del norte so we actually ran a flood like which was very you know very fitting because we were in under two declared disasters in del norte county this last year so amazing training for us so i'm gonna let commander stevens talk just a little bit about the pio training and anything else he wants to talk about for emmitsburg it's funny because I almost never speak at this podium and here I am twice in, <laughs> twice one, day. in one day. Um, uh, for starters, uh, you know, these people that, that Cindy mentioned that were training us from all over the place. I, as I was there, I could only imagine that they probably, you know, they get a lot of groups, a lot of organizations like ours throughout the year that they're looking at. And some of these people come in and they're probably, you know, really, I don't want to say bad, but they really need probably need a lot of help. And then there's probably groups that come in there and they're just short of perfect. And we are by no means perfect, but I think we were on the top end. I think we were showing those people that we, you know, we we do know what we're doing, and but there's room for improvement. And so you take a look at at the group that went, as Cindy said, it was from people all over the board, all over all ages. And you know, I've Cindy's been training me for the last 11 years. But some of the, these people then got, that, that were some newer people, got the benefit of coming in and going straight to this, this training that was, you know, this excellent training from the, you know, closer to the beginning of their introduction into the Emergency Operations Center. And that was really good because you've got a lot of bonding going on during this training. And everybody really came together. I mean, I think we have a pretty good group to begin with, but it, you could tell that there was, you know, uh, the, the, the glue was continuing to to hold and everything was doing good for us. Um, we, as I said, you know, we've got room to improve. You know, I I went in thinking, you know, well, I'm, I'm sitting pretty good because I've been doing this for quite a few years. Now, the gal that was, she was a professional uh, uh, news person for a TV channel and she showed several things that we could do to improve. And Quite annoying. Huh? Quite annoying she was, I can just say. <laughs> and, but, but she had some really good points and you know, so I was like, you know, I'm, I think we do, I'm, we do pretty good in our section and then next thing I know I'm taking notes. So, oh, that's a pretty good idea. So, you know, there, we did get things going. But the, 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 the thing I want to close with, the observation is that Again, I think we were one of the better groups that they probably see, even though they were tr teaching us stuff we didn't know. But the thing is, is the reason for that is because of Cindy. I think Cindy's kind of a, a hot commodity in this county and that she knows what she's doing and she's got us all straightened out. And you have to admit, there was times, and I don't know if it was designed that way, but there was times in that week where you were almostly, almost seemingly part of the 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 training cadre there mm -hmm. and I kept thinking to myself you know they bring these people from all over the place to come and train and I'm and, and I was I was pretty proud I was sitting back there I was in the back row and I sat back there and I thought several times they ought to think about bringing Cindy out here to train these people once in a while and so um, overall it was a it was a great trip a lot of bonding and and great experience so, you know, like what Bill is saying, there's a chance for us all to work together, but we had no real world interruptions. That's what made this priceless is, you know, we get together and we do all these disaster exercises, but somebody's going here, somebody's going here, somebody's answering phone calls. We were concentrated for one week working on disasters, which was amazing. Um, we did have lots of bonding time. You could see all the different things. You can obviously see the PIOs up there in a the quarter. You had Commander Henderson up there and you had Eric Weirs up there. Um, you had those people that were able to step up and do some training. And then you see Sherry Weir up there and Sylvia in the right hand. They were up there doing some training that they would not normally be able to participate in because other, other real emergencies would be happening in our world and they would get called out. 
Um, we learned a lot, um, you know, Councilman um, Short shared this on Facebook and asked for comments, but you could see that we, we learned a lot, but we had gaps. We definitely had gaps. Eric Weir was able to step up. He was actually the executive director for the city and the county because Jay and Neil couldn't uh, attend and our city manager obviously couldn't attend. So he was able to step up and he took, he took the lead and he did well for the whole community. So there was a lot of things that we learned. Um, one of the first things that really has came to mind and we've already had a meeting with the, the people involved is GIS. Man, we are missing out in Delmar County by not having a stronger GIS system. There is so much that can be used in a disaster situation. We, you know, you're able to see the floods coming. You can actually, you know, post where these evacuation sites are. There's so many things that we can do with GIS, and that's something that I'm hoping that you'll see as grant funding comes available for emergency preparedness. That you're going to see some of those projects coming out because I need, I, I really need that to be embellished. I need that to go. Um, we actually learned there's a lot more to volunteers. We're always talking about, oh, you've got to get them trained first before they can come in and help in your EOC. And that's not true. We learned that very quickly that that's not true. So there was a lot of, of things taught to us and we brought a lot home. Um, the time was priceless. You can see we all chipped in and rented a bus and went to Gettysburg. So we did have some downtime at night, but it was a chance for us all to bond together and work stronger and stronger together. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner, we now have our own little plaque up there. It says Del Norte County, along with the other communities that have ever been there. So pretty exciting time. Um, when we came back, so Office of Emergency Services, when we came back, it was almost very fitting that the, the Santa Rosa and the Northern fires broke out. Um, it was very, very upsetting to me because I was getting all these alerts, help, help, help us, send ambulances, send RNs, send respiratory therapists. Couldn't do that because we just don't have the resources here. But I went to Jay and Neil and I said, I think we have some, we have some expertise here. Can I go? Can I take a couple people with me from our community and go help them? Because they're going to need to help us in a disaster situation. He agreed. And I put the feeler out there and said, we're here to help if you need us. And they said, come. How, can, how soon can you be here? And it was exciting because Deborah Wakefield, Sherry Weir, and myself all packed up into a truck and we headed up to Santa Rosa. We spent many nights, we spent a night in the, in the vehicle, um, but we were actually able to go into Sonoma's Emergency Operational Center and help run their medical health branch, which was very exciting. So they called us the experts of Del Norte, which we are not, but we were able to give the education that we had taken from Emmitsburg and all these years of training and give back to that community and help them in a small way. But the education they gave us was priceless coming back to what we can use for an event of emergency like this in Delmar County. So it was a pretty, pretty um, just horrifying time, but it was exciting and then the less is that we could help and we could actually show our education. So what else have we been doing? Um, continuity of operations, continuity of government, recovery planning that's happening right now. We do have a uh, consultant that's been hired and we've been working very close with them. Check of fire assistance, including many things like d uh, the DART, the DHHS, others we met because we needed to have a access and functional needs shelter ready to go if Brookings needed us. Emergency management re recruitment. Curry County asked me to step up and help them recruit for an emergency manager and um, I was on the hiring panel. That was pretty nice. Gassy complex fire was going on, hazard mitigation updates happening. We have six grants, including CDPH, hazard mitigation, EMPG, and Homeland Security that we're working on. We are constantly updating our emergency oper operations plan from, ha from fatality management to whatever. We're constantly updating those plans. And just lots of other activities. Our latest one was drop, cover, and hold. And I hope you guys all drop, cover, and hold. I know, Roger, I got some pictures from Mr. Gitlin. Um, very exciting time for Del Norte County and the nation to practice what is so important is to duck, cover, and hold and available for questions. And just real quick, I'd like to expand on something Cindy said that, you know, here after the course, you know, her and some people were down helping Sonoma County. Before the course, as she touched on briefly, but I think there's more to the story there. She's also helping out with the Checo bar with Checo uh, with the whole fire thing going on north of the border, and so we're you know she's getting us prepared for our county, but here we are also prepared to help our fellow counties, just like they would hopefully be prepared to help us. Yes. And there's a lot more going on than you see. I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, Questions. Excellent comments, supervisors. I'll just add, add, oh, sorry, Supervisor Hemmings, I didn't see uh, Yeah, I, I, you touched on something that uh, kind of struck me as, as a little bit strange. 
um, because uh, we've had a GIS system for many years and I pushed for that for a long time so why haven't you provided data to our GIS system so that we have that available to us you, yeah, I mean I kind of felt I, like there was a complaint there but wouldn't this be incumbent on you to give the information actually with GIS it's a lot of funding um, we did purchase part of that GIS system years and years ago with grant funding through disaster preparedness and it was a very very simple from what I understand, a simple software that only provided a certain amount. But with, from what I understand with this training that we did, and we use it a lot, and it, that gap kept on coming forward and forward, is there's so much more things that you can do, much more software that you can plug in, more layers that can be provided to be put on top of this. And so that was a huge gap to, to me that, oh, wow, we could get these partners together and we could start building on these layers. We can start putting a little funding into there. So it, it honestly was a gap that was glaring to me and I had no idea it was such a gap. And so that's something that I came back with going, okay, GIS has to be on the forefront of this because there's a lot of technolo technology out there that can be used for disaster preparedness, but response more so than anything. We've seen it in Santa Rosa. They could actually see the fire coming. They had the layers where they could put the, the shelters at, and we were making decisions based on that GIS technology of when we needed to evacuate that thousand bed shelter. Didn't know about it. I just didn't have the knowledge. And so this was something, and this is, you know, Emmitsburg's important is because that's the type of things that comes glaringly to the front going, okay, you better start thinking about this. Yeah, so, Serena? I, I, I agree. Yeah, I'd like to kind of expand on that a little bit because there has been a commitment by the county for many years and, and Supervisor Hemmingson is, is familiar with that in regards to GIS. The system itself, and I'll disagree a little bit with Cindy on this one, it's not a, a mini system. It's a system that has to be built upon and it requires money. And the data that comes into that is very expensive to develop. And so we get limited at, at that point, and it's usually funding that limits us. The commitment to put the information together, um, you can go online right now, and, and I know they use the system back in Emmitsburg. It has flood mapping and tsunami mapping, the evacuation uh, maps. Uh, it, it's got parcel data. It's, the basics are all there and, and they've been expanded upon when money was available and data is available. So we've talked already about reaching out to some of the partners and getting even more data, but the commitment will have to be through funding, either grants or otherwise, to develop the data in the field to be able to put it on the system. And we have people to operate the system in both the city and the county, but what Cindy's talking about is extremely important to OES, it's extremely important to the county, but it's funding. And so as we go through this, um, we're going to be going in that direction and looking at whatever funding sources are available so that we can get that information to IET to be able to help out on that, on that end. Thank you for that clarification, Jay. Supervisor Gitlin. Cindy, you, you, had, you had mentioned that you are pursuing uh, grant opportunities for GIS funding. So wh what's the status on that? Just got back. Give, okay. give me time. Okay, so <laughs> that's, on, if, that's on your radar screen. But yeah, so we have EMPG and Homeland Security and CDPH gun funding that are all emergency preparedness. We can put projects like GIS. They can be approved into those grant funding. And so at what right now what our first step was is let's gather information. What are other counties using it for for disaster preparedness? And so we have a couple volunteers that have said they would reach out and help also. Once we gather those facts and see what they're being used for and what's possible out there for GIS and disaster response and preparedness, then we're going to come back to the table, get the partners going, well, okay, what kind of layers can we build and include in the mapping? and then come to the table and then put together a guideline of how much it's going to cost, how we can do this. This isn't something that could happen overnight. Obviously, it's very expensive. But if we can provide some projects in those grant fundings that we currently have and then start looking for others like hazard mitigation, things like that, that is all the potential, something I'm just getting my feet wet on. Well, knowing you as I do, you're re very resolute when you put your mind to something. I so will do it. You're, <laughs> you're just back and you're going to move this and prioritize this and begin to look for options Absolutely. so that we can build, as uh, CEO Serena Mintz, these layers, which always require the ORME. Yep. So the money issue can be dealt with at a time when we're dealing with our partners and at the same time uh, opportunities will come up uh, where there is grant funding to build step by step. So I congratulate you on that and I'll wait to hear more about how the progress on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank
Thank you. Thank you. Public comment on the presentation. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. I'll, I'll close with this as I did, did want to recognize OES and their efforts to re receive the grant funding that really helped bring the entire community to a point of education and self-betterment to be prepared for those disasters that definitely await us. There's no question about it. As with, was shared with us not too long ago by um, Chairman Ito from the city of Ritsu's Antikata, there's a disaster right off our coast that could happen anytime, like a tsunami that hit their backyard in 2011 with a 42-foot wall wave. And there's no question with the group that was assembled and the participation that occurred that we could be responding to a similar disaster and be very well prepared with the folks that are standing there behind us. I'm glad to see there's depth in the bench and this interest of volunteers throughout our community. That Cindy, that you're helping to lead that charge here and Commander Stevens, same helping to lead that charge to get people to recognize the importance of Op Office of Emergency Services here in Del Norte. Having heard some of the comments from those that attended, wonderful compliments for Del Norte County and the City of Crescent City and your volunteers as a whole as being above and one of the better classes that they've ever taught. That's amazing to hear. Um, I'll close by saying I've received some comments from Supervisor Gore in Sonoma County and it was really helpful to hear that Delnor County was present on their doorstep. And I'm glad, uh, Commander, you brought this up because to see Ms. Weir, Ms. Wakefield, Ms. Henderson in Sonoma County helping out with that first response is so critically important. And it was great to see Delnor County's name in the list of one of many counties to support in their time of disaster. So thank you again for that presentation. We really appreciate it. All right, we're going to go ahead and move to item, which is the 1035 timed item, which is to adjourn as the Board of Supervisors and reconvene as the Board of Equalization to conduct an assessment appeal hearing for parcel number 116-251-039, which is McQuillan, and this is year 1617. Is the applicant present today? Thank you. Um, we're going to go ahead and move forward. The application itself is an appeal of, of the assessed value of that application. The value on the roll that was given was $228,537. The applicant's opinion of value was $100,000 and $186,000. Um, Kylie. Can you please swear in the assessor? Can I get you to raise your right hand and state your name, please? My name is Steve Hart. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter now pending before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you, God? I do. Thank you. Okay. Steve Very Hart, Delmar County Assessor. Good morning. Office. Good morning. Okay, we have a change of ownership, and the date was 326. 2015 the property is located at 2185 Evergreen Lane and with this one there was an assumption of a loan so there was no sale price so looking at that there was no it doesn't fit the definition of an arm's length transaction so there was no sale price to go off of so we went ahead and looked at the comparable sales and I came up with um, 232,000. You can flip a few pages there. Here's the list of the comparable sales that were used to generate that number. There's some pictures there. Please proceed. Okay, um, I just wonder if there's any questions? It was just, um, maybe Questions at this time? Supervisors? Does not to be, appear to be any questions at this time. Okay, we'll let the applicant. Well, actually, actually if I could. I Supervisor did, I did have a question, and this has to do with the, appli the applicant's uh, information that we've gotten. Um, everything that I see appears to have either a tooth 2010 date 
or a 2012 date on comparables. So that's not something that we can use as information. Is that not correct? Because that's not the, the year that we're dealing with. I think the contention is, the applicant can explain this more, but with the assumption of a loan, the, the loan was, the, the property was previously purchased and there, there was an appraisal done as of October of 12. And then that established a value, so then there was a negotiation and then the Yurok Indian Housing purchased the property. So that was, so October of 12. But what happened was with the assumption of the loan, the deed was not processed until March of 2015. So what we're looking at here is March 2015, 326.15, and then we're allowed to go 90 days past that. Okay. Yes. So that's the, that's the year that we're looking for values, though. We, we, we couldn't go back to 2012 or 2010 or anything like that. You could go back, but I think as we went into the recession, properties were going down, 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 and then as we came back up, there's, I believe there's a difference. So if you were to compare a, a 2012 to a 2015, there would definitely need to be some time adjustment to that. Okay. So, you, you, so you could take the appraisal of October 12, but then it would need to be refined again with some time adjusted to bring it forward. Yeah, I, I, Jerry, I mean, 2012, you'll look at the appraisals and they'll even show the market as declining. We didn't start to grow in this market until 14, and by 15, we were definitely up. I yeah, mean, so. So the difference of 12, when I look at it, is it, I can't, it doesn't compare. I look at your price, and I think you're pretty low. If you were looking at today's prices, maybe it was okay in 15, yes. but to even go to 17, it's, it's really low. So I don't think looking at 2012 in a declining market, compared to 15 in an uprising market would be a fair comparable. Additional questions, comments? Supervisor. I'll be interested to hear um, Ms. McQuillan's presentation, but it seems this is an issue of land value, not improvement necessarily. Uh, I see the land value, the old value is $78,016. The new value, you actually lowered it, 74000 I'd like to see the evidence uh, from Ms. McQuillan when you, she comes up to show us where there's a $30,000 land value uh, equivalent. So I, this doesn't seem to be regarding the actual improvement per se, but more of the actual raw land. Yeah. Is, that my, is that a correct assumption? Well, we need to remember that for property tax purposes, the assessor's tasked with we have to value land and improvement separately. So that stems from if people buy a piece of property at, at one date, you get your base year value based on market conditions for that period of time. And then as we go forward, people build improvements on it. So, so we're tasked to make the, the separate assessments. But for these purposes here, I always like to caution people, it's the total value that we're looking at. The, the allocations that the assessor's office use, you know, they're, we can, they can be questioned, we can talk about them, but really what we're looking at is the total value. So the allocation is what it is, um, but always remember total value. Supervisor Hemmingson. And there, there's also a supplemental assessment. Is that because there was some improvements? In, in 2014-15, looks like there was a supplemental assessment. The supplemental, every time there's a value change. Okay, it's that was just because of the change. Then. Yeah, so okay. any, any That wasn't there's... something that they'd done to the home to improve it or add it on or anything like that? No, that was just from the okay. value change from the old to the new. All right, thanks. Very good. Further questions? Very good. Let's go ahead and call Ms. McQuillan to the dais. Kylie, can you please swear in Ms. McQuillan? Hello. Can I get Hi. you to raise your right hand and state your name, please? Mary McQuillan. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter now pending before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? Yes. Thank you. Please 
feel free to present any evidence that you have or rebuttal to the argument that's being um, made. My, my argument is that when um, I assumed the loan from the Yurok Indian Housing Authority and when it was appraised, it was appraised, I believe, at um, $186,000. And according to the appraisal report, there's a lot of issues with that home. There's a lot of dry rot. Um, I'm not sure, just since living there, I've come to learn that um, there's a lot of drainage issues on the property. It doesn't drain properly. And since I've taken ownership of the home, I've not made any improvements to it. There's been no improvements made. And the, the, that's mine. I'm, you know, I've not done anything like this, so I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not on sure ground here for myself personally. But that, that's my argument is it was appraised at $186,000. No new appraisal was done. When I assumed the loan, it was as is. And that's, it, it still stands the same. And that, that's my argument. Very good. Thank you. Questions? Uh, how, how much property? I believe it's just on about an acre of land, yeah. give or take. Yeah. For some reason, I can never find that in these things. It's much easier to ask. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Super. Other comments? Additional comments? Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. We're going to go ahead and bring this back to the board. Um, do you have any additional questions for the assessor or the applicant? Anybody? Okay. Public comment. Okay, seeing none, we're going to go ahead and bring this back to uh, conclude the hearing. Do you still wish to, Ms. McClellan, can I please have you approach the dais again? Do you still wish to pursue a findings of fact in this case? Um, you is that check the box um, on your application? Is that where you tell me your answer as to whether or not you're going to uphold the, the rise in my taxes or your? Or on the no, I think it's a separate issue. That would basically, if if you wanted to continue us, for us to pursue a findings of fact, that would kind of delay this process at this point, and we wouldn't potentially make a hearing today but I could ask County Council to clarify that for us so the the findings of fact um, you had checked the box that you wanted findings of fact but there's a fee for the fine the board can make a decision without issuing findings of fact but if you want written findings of fact the fee is $125 and so you um, you can pay that you would have to pay it prior to the end of the hearing and the board would likely take it under submission um, and then provide you those findings of fact or you can waive having written findings and the board may or may not take it under submission might make a ruling now from the dais um, but you would not have to pay that hundred and twenty five dollars I think I'd like to waive that okay very good thank you very much okay then we're gonna go ahead and conclude this hearing and ask the board if they're ready to make a decision on this matter. I, I don't see the justification um, for Ms. McQuillan, the applicant's uh, valuation. And again, I'm going to bring up the land because that seems to be the difference. I don't see the evidence to support the applicant's uh, request to uh, move to 186,000 from the 228, 537. I, I don't see that evidence unless it's there and I'm not seeing it. Do you have, and I appreciate what, what Assessor Short, <coughs> um, Steve said, um, is that uh, you have to look at the whole picture, but clearly uh, the issue is not with uh, the improvement on the land, but it, it's the land itself. So. I don't see lots are worth thirty thousand dollars on an acre in on Evergreen Street. I don't see that. So unless you have some evidence to show, I, I can't support your application request, Ms. McQuillan. Additional comments from the board? Are we ready to move forward? Okay. 
we do need a motion in this matter. I'll make a motion to uh, approve the assessor's um, valuation of property at two hundred twenty-eight thousand five thirty-seven. As presented by the assessor this morning. Okay, we have a motion on the table. I'll second. And a second. Kylie, can you please pull the vote? Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right. 1045 timed item, which is adjourn as the Board of Equalization and reconvene as the Board of Supervisors to conduct public hearing to approve and authorize submission of the 2017 Community Development Block Grant application and approve and adopt the resolution entitled A Resolution Approving and Application for Funding and Execution of a Grant Agreement and any amendments thereto from the 2017 funding year of the State Community Development Block Grant Program as requested by the County Administrative Officer. And you don't look like the county administrative officer. A lot cuter. Thanks. Good morning, Good morning, Tony. How are you? I'm good. Um, before you this morning for consideration and approval um, is the proposed 2017 Community Development Block Grant application, also known as CDBG. And I'm going to refer to it as CDBG because it's easier than saying it all. Um, just a little background and history for all of you. The notice of funding availability for the CDBG grant was released on September 1st and listed approximately $27 million available in program funding to be allocated throughout the state. Um, the county application can be a maximum of $5 million and include up to two activities. Um, a public hearing was held on September 20th uh, to receive input as, from the public as a part of the public participation requirement for CDBG. The proposals received as a result of that public hearing were then taken to the grants goal committee seeking a recommendation to bring before you today. Um, the state has been working at yet again another redesign of the CDBG program um, and have included some changes for the 2017 funding year. Uh, the first one being they decreased the number of activities allowed per application from three to two. They've increased the application limits allowed from two million to five million. Um, the biggest change that's going to benefit Del Norte County is the introduction of a request for waiver of the 50% expenditure rule. Um, basically, this will allow us to request a waiver of the conditions they placed back in 2012 that each county or city has to spend 50% of their grant funds on hand before they can apply for new funding. Um, the redesign will assist us because of, unfortunately we have not spent 50% of our 2015 funding, uh, which would disallow us for funding in 2017. Um, basically what we're going to be applying for um, with this waiver is a shovel ready project, which is one of the requirements. And we feel that we meet that requirement with one of our public infrastructure projects. So as a result of the NOFA, as a result of the recommendations from the grants goal committee um, on October 10th, the proposed county application will include the following. Uh, we are going to be applying for, like I said, the public improvements project, which is a project that's benefiting the low to moderate income area based on the census tract, um, which is going to be an infrastructure improvement project providing uh, sidewalks um, on Northcrest Drive, bike lane sidewalks and draining facilities, excuse me, along the east side of Northcrest from Washington Boulevard to Harding. There will be additional alternatives added, in, including um, Actually, it's going to ease transportation drainage improvements. I'm bumbling this up, and I apologize. Um, ideally, this will connect the county's only resource mission to accessible active transportation and public services via Harding Avenue. Um, we will also be applying for public services under this uh, grant agreement uh, for court advocacy service, which is CASA, as well as the senior nutrition program. Our total project. Um, our total application is going to be $2.3 million, and we feel that this is a competitive application. And so I'm looking for approval uh, from you this morning that will allow us to move forward with this application and apply. The deadline is December 1st. Any questions? Questions from the board. Supervisor Gitlin. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we, we sit on the grant 
Grants Goals Committee, uh, Supervisor Berkowitz and I. Uh, tell us about the applicants who applied uh, and the justification, and it's done by consensus of why you think and why the, the, the consensus of the committee here feels that these two bids were are more competitive. So that seems to be the criterion. Okay, are you referring just to the public services itself or well, all there's public services and which are there were three applicants, I believe. Four. Four. I'm For sorry. public services. Four. Yes. And they're all good. Yeah. But what makes one more competitive? I don't know what I don't understand. Okay, what we makes have to, no, we, we feel they're all worthy projects. Yes, Ex absolutely all. And we are applying for uh, a grant, which we didn't get last year. So it seems to be every other year we have a greater. What makes this, these two, the court advocacy services, the CASA grant of 250 on the Senior Nutritional Center, um, another 250, what makes these more competitive? We believe that the stronger the application, the more competitive we are going to be when they're going to review these public services. They're proven. We've funded okay. CASA in the past since 2010, I believe, even before that, I think, as well as the senior center. Okay. So we believe it's, it's, it's based on competitiveness and how it's going to be looked overall. Well, these are, these are difficult decisions to me yes. because we have lots of needs mm -hmm. in this county. And of the four, I would like to, I wish there were four applications so we could each give and we couldn't parse the money out and take the 250 and cut it down so we could have more. That's no. not how the rules work. No, the requirement for the public services part mm -hmm. portion of the bucket of money is allowing two funding underneath that one bucket. Okay, and so that uh, allows us the exemption because we've not spent the 50% that allows us to be considered by the California Grants uh, uh, group to, to have this considered um, as making the application more appealing uh, that will it be, qualifies us that i'm will sorry be for my stumbling no, on that's words okay. but the it, it gets a little complicated the public infrastructure project is what we're going to be proposing a shovel ready mm -hmm. that's going to allow us to be eligible for funding okay all right thank you very much thank you supervisor supervisor berkowitz uh thank you tony i think the the main thing on this is that there was consensus by all of the stakeholders in this uh, in this group in this meeting that what we're doing is we're serving the very young and the very old. The neglected right. and the elderly, correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most important thing that we can do. Right. right. Thank you, Supervisor. That was the consensus, yes. Any other questions? Very good. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll make that motion to approve the Community Block Grant Development Application which adopts a resolution entitled Resolution Approving of an Application for Funding uh, to uh, for the court advocacy services, the CASA group for 250, uh, 250,000, the Senior Nutrition Center for 250,000, and the Northcrest Drive Active Transportation Infrastructure, 1.8 million for general administration, additional 179,402. That is my motion. Thank and you, I will second. And we have a second. Let's go to public comment. Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Kylie, can you please pull the vote? Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on with item number six, which is our 1055 timed item. Approve modified road improvement standards with conditions and findings as shown on the findings and conditions attachment located on Miranda Lane in Smith River, California. APN number 101-100-061. I see we have Ms. Bauer here with us today. Hi. Good morning. Okay, so we have an application in for a building permit for a single family residence that's accessed from Miranda Lane. Miranda Lane is an old easement or right of way and it's only 20 feet wide. Our, our current road standards would require that easement to be 50 feet wide which is why we are here requesting a modified road improvement standard. Uh, presently, the improved road surface is about eight to nine feet of paving and a little bit of rock as well beyond. Um, and our current road standard would be a 24 foot wide graveled surface with four foot shoulders on each side. Um, if we proceeded and only did our road improvements, we still would be outside of the right of way. 
so we are here to consider um, alternative means to achieve the same practical effect. What we're proposing is to leave the road surface at eight or nine feet, mm -hmm. but to add a turnout at somewhere wherever it fits. There's existing places where you can pull over, but they're not within an easement, so they can't be guaranteed. And so this would be formally establishing a road right away or a, a road surface and turnout area. Um, as the other issue with the 20 foot wide right away is there's no way to do a turnaround um, within the easement width. And so we're also proposing a turnaround. However, this turnaround will actually be at the house on the property and it won't be in the right of way, but they'll have to dedicate an easement. It's not gonna affect the setbacks for where they were proposing to put the house. So the house can still go where they wanted to put it. Um, and then we, so we went through as the ERC and made a recommendation to the planning commission. The planning commission made the same recommendation to the board, but we hadn't received any comments from Cal Fire or local fire. Since the Planning Commission's decision, we did receive a letter from Local Fire uh, talking about the fact that there is an existing turnout, again, but it's not within the easement, and also a request that they reestablish and maintain a shoulder width. And so, in addition to the conditions recommended by the Planning Commission, a condition was added for maintenance of existing shoulder width. Great, thank you. Questions for our assistant engineer? Yeah, Rosanna, before you take off. Um, the, the maintenance, the maintenance of the right of way. How do we enforce that? Um, ultimately, I would, I would look at. I think it's California Civil Code, and there's provisions for maintenance of uh, private roads and easements, and so it would be a civil matter if maintenance wasn't performed. But this is a condition that this is and, a condition. That's an avenue that we can use in this this roadway. Uh, my understanding is, uh, from what I read, uh, is roughly 10 feet of road surface and then two foot shoulders on each side. Is that correct? I was trying to recall. Did it was it? It was eight. Was it maintaining the eight or expanding it to 10? I, I thought it was eight. I think it's to leave well, the existing. That's the current. Yeah. Is to leave it at eight. Well, we what, can. What easily. I saw in the, I think it was the, the fire department's um, recommendation. I think was 10 feet with two foot. Shoulders. I could, I certainly could be wrong. I might not have seen. I, I read it. I might not have seen it. Yeah, it does. It says because uh, it bring it to 14 feet total. Yeah, right. The 10 okay. two on either side. Well, we can. I can move forward and add a condition that has the existing eight foot paved surface increased to 10 feet. Well, yeah. I, if I, if that's your guys' recommendation. Well, I, I'm just going off the recommendation of the of the, the uh, fire chief. I think. It's yes, you are. I just saw that. Yes. And I, it's but I think he was using the figure that there was roughly 10 feet. I don't know that it was a, a set in stone width, that it had to be 10 feet. I mean, if it's <coughs> 9 foot or 8 foot 6 or I think something as close to that. It's I think, right at 9 I think, feet. Yeah, I think overall, I think what we're looking for is whatever roadway is there plus shoulders enough to make that 14 foot wide. So I'm, I don't know that we need to have them go out and pave a one foot strip. If that if it's paved, I don't know. If it's I, paved I, or just road surface. I would not require it to be paved unless okay. you gave us that direction. No, that's fine. I, for some reason, I was thinking that they had, they had set a paved surface, so um, and that was just my memory. And okay. It's not always correct. But. So what I'm hearing is a total improved surface of 10 feet wide can be rocked, and then two foot shoulders that can be mowed, essentially. Does right. that sound right? Well, that's yeah. I'm just going off what the recommendation was. Of the, I don't want to. Burgers. undermine the the uh, the uh, the fire department but uh, you know, I also don't want to overburden the, the applicant okay so let's add to the condition that I put on here regarding the shoulder width that the width of the improved road surface needs to be 10 feet well let's get yeah, once you guys weighed get in by the board first yes, we might not all agree with that that's fine supervisor get one uh, Rosanna don't run away <laughs> First of all, I think it was a real challenge in finding this street. Yes. <laughs> I must have blown by it about three, four times. I went out one day and went to look for it, and it, there is no there is no signage there. It, 
I, I said, well, it's 0.7 miles south of Seascape, so I knew that. So I kind of measured up, it's got to be that road, and it didn't look like it was. And then I went up, and, and that is a, a very challenging road for any vehicle to be on, let alone a fire vehicle. So I would certainly like to see that Smith River Fire has checked in on this because they need to sign off on this for a certificate, certificate of occupancy. Is that correct? Um, they have contributed. We have a letter from them in the packet. So there, once once we do what the uh, the conditions, once we meet the conditions as set forth, I'm saying w uh, the Smith River Fire District has not signed off on a certificate of occupancy on this property that's going to be built. Is that correct? They're not going to sign off on it. They're going to give us their input, and we're going to take that under consideration, which is what they gave us in the letter that we received after the Planning Commission took action and where Supervisor Hemmingson was discussing the 10-foot instead of the 8- or 9-foot surface right. as well so, as the paper. So my question is, is what type of vehicles would be necessary to negotiate a road like that? Is it a 10-foot road or is it a 14-foot road or what kind of a road is it to access uh, ingress and egress uh, to, uh, to deal with a possible uh, fire hazard there? What, what's the answer? I don't know that. Cal Fire recommends a 10-foot lane width. And so that's typically our base. It was an oversight that I, I didn't say anything in the conditions about expanding it and from 8 or 9 to 10 feet. And shoulders? I mean, shoulders side. aren't as well defined under the fire code. Uh, we have our local road standards, which would be two, to 2 or 4 feet for a rural road. But under the fire code, it just says shoulders, but it doesn't give us a width most of the time. So are you suggesting that your conditions, you'd want to amend them here uh, for, for this road? At this point, they're conditions of the Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I can tell you the input of staff, but it's going to be ultimately your guys' decision yeah. to modify the recommendations of the Planning Commission. And again, the recommendation of the Planning Commission is? It is the, to leave the existing paved surface. Thank you. I added the condition, the final condition, with respect to Smith River Fire's comment about shoulders. Thank you. And I agree with that. I mean, we should go with what the fire feels they need, and they state the road plus two feet on either side. Okay. Additional comments from the board? Let's go ahead and open this up for public comment. Please. Uh, okay. can, can you please approach the dais? And the little fellow's welcome, too. Um, I was the one that applied for the improvement standards um, they did have I was just gonna say that Cal Fire did stop by I guess they didn't turn in the report which they said they would it was a I don't remember their two names now um, but they said that the road because this is addressing your question that the road was fine but that we had to clear they pointed out two spots that they wanted us to clear back hedges for two feet shoulder on each side so I'm there so I'm just saying again that's not official but um, it looks like they're requirements might be similar to Smith River Fire. Can so. you please state your name for the record? Oh, Lauren Seymour. Nice to meet you, Lauren. Thank, Thank you. you. And the little guy's name? This is Gunner Seymour. Hi, Gunner. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for that clarification. Additional public comment? Okay, we're going to go ahead and bring it back to the board. What's your recommendation, board? Stick with the conditions as... Uh, Moved forward by the County Planning Commission, or do you want to add additional conditions? Yeah, I would move uh, move that we approve the modified road improvement standard uh, conditions uh, to reflect a 10-foot roadway and two-foot shoulders. I get what you're saying. I think Smith River Fire said 10, but it may only be 8 or 9. Is that correct? existing right now that's my concern right now I can, get we, the um, two. can we either have a second motion or second. before we okay we have a motion a second okay please proceed with the discussion I just want clarification because it's my understanding that the road there right now might only be eight or nine and what they're asking for is two additional feet I don't want them to have to build that road out if it's nine feet to ten and then add their two when my understanding from the fire department is that they just need two feet on either side Am I just not understanding that correctly? Well, what I read was, excuse me, what I read was 10-foot roadway and 2-foot shoulders, 
to a width of 14 feet. I think it even said in the letter. No, that's exactly what it said. Yeah. But my concern is, is the roadway already 10 feet? It's not. It's no. eight. So we're going to be requiring them to add another two feet and then they're... But it's not pavement. It's We're just talking about gravel. Gravel. Correct? Okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the table. Further discussion from the board. Okay, very good. No. Kylie, please pull the vote. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Okay, that concludes our timed agenda items. We'll go ahead and move forward with our regular items on the agenda under general government, item number 18 which is approved and authorized the Tala Indian Nation to apply for a coastal grading permit to construct a parking lot and VISTA related features on a county property as requested by the Director of Community Development. Good morning, Ms. Constable. Good morning. Uh, the County of Del Norte retains a public easement over an area of land that is located at what we call the mouth of the Smith River. Uh, it's where uh, Indian South Indian Road and the mouth of the Smith River Road converge near River's End. Mm -hmm. uh, the area is currently paved and it has uh, some primitive uh, vista um, offerings at that site. The Talawa Dani Nation has um, approached the county uh, with a request to um, have permission to apply for a coastal grading permit in order to remove the existing um, paved surface that is there and to replace it with a parking lot that would include 11 parking spaces of which one of those would be ADA van accessible and um, two tandem parking spaces that would be uh, available for recreational vehicles. The um, area between the parking area and the top of the bank would be improved with a, uh, a walkway that would have picnic tables, planters, um, benches, etc. that would allow uh, the public to have uh, a very nice uh, experience of enjoying the uh, mouth of the river and the, the ocean. If, um, lastly, uh, the project was uh, brought to the Future Facilities uh, Committee on, I believe, October 11th, and it received a favorable recommendation of approval to the board. Thank you. You're welcome. Comments from the board? Yeah, uh, Heidi, wasn't wasn't the recommenda recommendation to include lighting? Did you say lighting? Uh, lighting was one of the suggestions that we received at the meeting that we have passed along to the okay. uh, the engineer uh, company that has been hired by the Talawa Dani to work on the project. Yeah, there were several design-related um, items that came up during the the future facilities meeting that we have already passed along. But this project will, it, uh, assuming it's a recommended um, that the tribe is given permission, it, they will apply for the coastal grading permit. It'll go before our county planning commission. There'll be public hearing notification uh, via the newspaper um, posting on site and to all uh, property owners within 300 feet. So um, there'll be other opportunities if uh, things arise um, that we can address through the permitting process. Very good. Go ahead and open up for public comment. Seeing none, we're going to go ahead and bring it back to the board. I move for approval. We have a motion on the table. Second. And a second. Kylie, can you please pull the vote? Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Thank you for uh, getting this to the table. Um, another excellent opportunity for a partnership with the Taladini Nation, as we just witnessed with the swearing-in ceremonies of uh, Officer Wade. All right, we're going to go ahead and move forward with item number 19, which is approve and authorize the chair to sign and send a letter to the U.S. Department of Transportation supporting the Alternative Essential Air Service proposal of Contra Airlines and the AEAS grant application from the Border Coast Regional Airport Authority as requested by Chair Howard. Susan, I know you're here in the audience. Um, thank you for sticking with us. Um, real briefly, could you kind of highlight us on what the decision of the Border Coast Airport Authority was on, in this matter and the request? Certainly. So as our two Border Coast um, members of your board could uh, attest the uh, vote last week um, was there was one that uh, did vote no on contour the balance of the board 
voted for Contour Indigo with the alternate essential air service uh, grant application. By doing this, it means that we um, write a new grant and send it into the um, DOT, but rather than the regular essential air service of the past where the DOT uh, pays the carrier directly, with this alternate uh, grant, they would reimburse us as we pay the air carrier. Um, the grant application itself uh, has already gone off. It went off with a, an excellent letter from Congressman Huffman attached. Uh, the uh, DOT has responded working with us uh, to um, make the grant exactly as they would like to have it to move it forward. They, they were immediately engaged and we find that very encouraging. They've had numerous talks with um, um, Contour as, as well. And so um, I think that certainly the various visits uh, to the DOT has been helpful. The um, airport staff has a good relationship with um, the DOT as well. But I think that they really are starting to understand um, the difficulties in this particular community for our air service. And uh, they've been nothing but helpful. We are looking at this point of hoping to go through the process and have uh, contour um, here and ready to go by early March. And I'm more, I know there could be many, many questions. And I, that's just kind of a quick summary, but no. anything you'd like to know? It's appreciated. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. Questions from the board? Supervisor Gitlin. Susan, the actual application of the process is, if I'm not mistaken, is what, $9.88 million over 30 months? Is that my understanding? Actually, what it, oh, and I'm sorry, I don't have the application with me. Um, the actual grant application would be, it's at 100%, which brings it to $14 million, and it's over 31 months, because mm -hmm. the DOT suggested that we make it from... March 1 of this year through September 30th of 2020. Now the reason for that is that you cannot have essential air service and alternative essential air service grants in the same federal fiscal year uh, and there's in September 30th. So instead they had us use the date from March 1 through September 30th, 2020. So um, thinking optimistically that this, uh, uh, this contract will be approved by the DOT, when do you think s would service on new contour begin effective March 1st? Mm -hmm. So which would mean that uh, Penn Air would continue to serve this market uh, through its, uh, uh, its current contract uh, through what, the, the end of the year? Or their would there be an overlap? Or would there, there yeah. would be no gap where there is no service? The, their current contract was the essential air service contract that would have gone clear through um, September of 2019. So they are operating on a hold-in order, Penn Air is, operating on a hold-in order by the Department of Transportation to provide service to us until we have a new carrier. Penn Air has indicated their um, plan to continue providing that service and thus far have worked with us well and you know, all, you know, as far as the crystal ball tells us, uh, things look good for that to be continued on. For us to be able to start March 1, that means the DOT, you know, it, the grants that we looked at in the past took anywhere from the fastest was two and a half months to run up through the DOT to four months. And based on the feedback we've gotten from the DOT, they plan to expedite this. We should be on the short end. The carrier will then need two months. So March 1 is the target date at this okay. point. The, the reason I'm asking about this, when I heard you say that they can't operate the same fiscal year, mm -hmm. calendar year, I'm not sure if you said calendar fiscal. year. Okay. Fiscal. Okay, so that's not the fact that Penn Air continues to serve on an EAS contract up till um, February 28th is, is still okay. Right. Effective March 1st, once the contract is approved, uh, then the new AEAS, -E the alternate right. essential air service contract, 
uh, for the additional amount. Um, and again, I thought that figure was just under $10 million would kick in and it would run for 31 months. Is that my understanding? It is 31 months, yes. And the figure is uh, increased because it has to be entered at 100%, but then the grant itself is for 98% completion. That's where the difference is in the figures. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Additional questions for Susan while she's here? Supervisor Hemmingson? I just have a comment. Uh, thank you, uh, Susan. Uh, you know, this, it, we, have, we have had an opportunity to step forward um, with having three uh, airlines uh, do proposals for us. But this, I think, is not only a step forward, but a step up. So we, we get advantage of being able to step up and step forward at the same time. So with that, I would make a motion that we send a letter of support. Okay, we have a motion on the table and a second. Public comment. Okay, seeing none, we're gonna go ahead and bring it back to the board. Kylie, can you please pull the vote? Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Thank you, Susan. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on with item number 20, which is discussed and direct staff to draft a letter opposing the expansion of California Department of Fish and Wildlife Lands Pass program that implements fees for people visiting the Lake Earl Wildlife Area, among other areas here in Del Norte County. Um, this just came to our attention recently last Tuesday when uh, Deputy Director Stafford Lair from the Department of Fish and Wildlife was here to visit with the Del Norte County Fish and Game Commission. And the commission uh, had this item on their agenda at this time. And I'm not sure how this item escaped us because it was heard by the California Fish and Game Commission in August of 2016. But we were tailing the commission at that period of time over issues with the Klamath River. And I am just befuddled why at that time nobody from the department approached us in Donut County about this issue potentially to charge our visitors, the residents of Delnark County, just to ask us three of the wildlife areas in our backyard. And it is absolutely disappointing. Um, why this letter didn't even come to the board is another disappointment. I just can't believe the state cannot communicate with this board. And it just continues to happen. And this is one glaring example. I wanted our board to consider writing a, and drafting a letter to the state to the effect that not only do we want to lodge some form of protest about fees to access Department of Fish and Wildlife lands in our backyard, but say, hey, you need to at least consult with us prior, which we have a standing standing opinion on and policy on with the Delmar County Supervisors for many years now. So uh, that's what I'd like to open up for discussion with the board. Supervisor Gitlin. I'm really confused on this this whole thing it is caught me at surprise um what are the, how much are the fees what if they want to charge they want to charge a daily rate which would be yeah. four dollars and thirty cents okay. or an annual $24. fee okay $24. is this a fait accompli is this going to happen whether this sending a letter of, of opposition um is it is already on set fiscally uh, that uh, the department of fish and wildlife is going to do this uh, yeah yeah, it appears so. However, there could be some catches which they didn't consider, which uh, might we might take advantage of this. I'd as certainly, earlier. I'd certainly oppose the. Uh, I, I would support sending this letter of opposition. I'd like to see that there's five wet signatures for each of the five supervisors, depending upon the fact that we all agreed uh, uh, to let them know we're resolute on this and we want it reconsidered. I'd like a, a very strong letter of. of of opposition to this. It's outrageous and it's uh, catching everybody off surprise. It's kind of, uh, um, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, unethical the way they presented this. So without any discussion whatsoever, they're going to do this. And it hurts the people, it hurts our tourism, it hurts, it's, it's just a total negative. I can't, I'm outraged by it. So um, I hope you consider doing a five signature wet signatures on that. Would certainly. Other comments from the board? Okay, let's go ahead and open it up to public comment. It's a good afternoon. Good, it's good afternoon now? It is. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, Greg Bianchi here. Uh, can you guys enlighten me a little bit? Maybe the rest of the group out here wants to know, what is this all about exactly that's kind of struck us by 
surprise. It's like uh, somebody did a flanking sure. movement on us, and all of a sudden now we have to deal with something. Which seems to entail? it seems to happen a lot. Um, sometimes when the state doesn't communicate with us, in this case, it was the California Department of Fish and Wildlife that was directed by the state legislature to find ways to increase revenues in their budget. And the, they brought this issue to the California Fish and Game Commission in August 2016 mm -hmm. and asked if this mechanism, in this case, which would be charging access fee to um, essentially uh, wild lands that the department owns. Some of these lands are in our backyard, like Crescent City Marsh and Lake Earl and Tolowas, right. to charge access fees to those lands. And how which, do Sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. How, how in the heck are they going to do that? Are they going to put a, a yeah, they're a fishing post, game guy gonna, out there? They're going to post signs, and you, some way they'll enforce it. If you it. take the wrong turn, you can't say, can't use that as an alibi. You just yeah. took a wrong turn, happened to be out there, and then there's they, there's a lot wrong with this, sir. It just it's kind of ludicrous the fact that these people can impose such a thing on us, and then we're just sitting here with our thumbs going, "What the heck happened?" <laughs> you know, it's like, wow. There's your government for you, isn't it? All right. Thank, Thank you, you for your much. comments. Good afternoon. <coughs> Linda said a fifth district. I support this letter that you're opposing. I don't think that our area was the only one hit. Correct. There were other states involved here, but the way I look at it is <coughs> oh <coughs> is um we already pay taxes on this. We shouldn't have to pay again. And uh, a lot of people here enjoy, such as myself, hiking through these areas. And um, I wouldn't be able to afford that, $4.23 per time you wanted to go there, especially if you go almost every day. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Additional public comment? We'll go ahead and bring it back to the board. Mr. Chair, I'll make that motion to send a very strong letter of opposition to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife opposing the lands pass program <clears throat> that implements these fees for people visiting Lake Earl wildlife area. Second. We have a motion and a second on the table. Uh, further discussion? Correction, with five wet signatures, thank you. With five wet signatures? Correction. Yeah, I just, it's, I just think it's, it's really, uh, a huge disappointment that, uh, um, as uh, as Chair Howard said, uh, you know we were we have been following uh, fish and wildlife uh, pretty closely for quite some time, and none of us uh, remember receiving any kind of notification um, on this particular issue. Now, you know if you've got a hunting license or if you have a fishing license or if you're under the age of 16, you don't pay a fee. Uh, but still, uh, to throw this stuff in a disadvantaged community, I would almost guarantee you that they will, it will cost them more to put up all the signage that they have to put up uh, in order to tell you that they're going to charge you a fee as they're ever going to make um, off of the, the day use fee or monthly use fee that they're charging. Um, it's just real disappointing that they, that they came all the way up here and went to the local Fish and Game Commission uh, but didn't notify the Board of Supervisors that they were even in the area. And, and these were some pretty high up people. Um, that's a real disappointment also, um, you know, that they would notify that group and not notify the rest of us. Thank you. And I'll close. I want to make sure if it is community development that ends up drafting this letter for uh, our office of administration to include the California Coastal Commission on that, as I believe there's probably some significant issues with the coastal development permit that they would be interested in, in hearing about in this case. And I certainly, as a board member, I think at least our public roads, like Kellogg, like Lakeview, they could continue to access those roads without a fee and go boat and do whatever they want at the end of our public roads. But anyways, we'll see how that they react to this comment. So we have a motion and a second on the table. Kylie, please pull the vote. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right, we're going to go ahead and move to item number 21, which is considered miscellaneous legislative and budget matters pertinent to the County of Del Norte. 
authorize the chair to sign and send appropriate letters with respect to matters pending before the state or federal government. Jay, you got anything for us today? Nothing additional that isn't currently on the agenda in regards to uh, legislation. We're getting copious amounts of bills that were signed by the governor, some that uh, apply to us and many that don't. And uh, unfortunately, um, he signs a number of those and, and some of those will uh, have an effect on us down the road, maybe not immediately, but down the road. So uh, we see this each year as they go through and we've advocated against a number of those and we've also, as was presented with uh, the RCRC presentation in CSAC, we've also supported a number and uh, we'll see as those come forward what those impacts are. We sure have. Questions for Jay? Okay. Seeing, seeing none, we'll go ahead and move to item number 22, which is direct staff to prepare a letter to the Trump administration and William Kirkland, Special Assistant to the President and Deputy Director of Governmental Affairs regarding rural infrastructure funding set aside for last chance grade. I believe Supervisor Berkowitz, you were going to take the lead on this? Thank you, Chairman Howard. Uh, first of all, before I begin, I want to state that this proposal is not a set aside for last chance grade. So after two trips to Washington, D.C., one thing should be evident by now. There will never be enough money coming from existing sources to finance the $300 million to $1.3 billion it would cost for a bypass to last chance grade. Current benefit studies for last chance grade that are now being conducted in Washington D set it on the amount it costs to keep repairing last chance grade versus how much it would cost to build a bypass. We don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that if the government spends an average of $2 million a year to keep the existing road functioning to them, that's a lot more cost effective than spending 300 billion to $1.3 billion all at once for a bypass. Caltrans estimates that the bypass could be done by the year 2039, but even at that timeline, they have no idea where the money would come from to actually build it. As much as we would like Congressman Huffman to induce, introduce legislation to actually fund the bypass, there's no hope of getting a co-sponsor for the bill or even getting a hearing on it if it were actually introduced and no chance of getting it through Congress, much less getting it signed by the president. So there has to be a better way, and I think there is. Any bill that's introduced in Congress or the administration's support for the bypass has to have broader support. According to Mr. William Kirkland, the special assistant to the President Trump, the president's $1 trillion infrastructure program is designed to replace and revitalize the nation's roads, bridges, and tunnels. In order for us to have a chance of getting part of these funds for a bypass the last chance grade, we need to broaden our focus. In light of this, I would like our board to consider a letter to the administration and specifically addressed to Mr. Kirkland and others that would consider the following categories that could be considered for priority funding under the president's infrastructure program. One, there should be specific set-asides for rural counties with populations of 100,000 people or less. Two, that priorities for funding would be those two-lane federal highways that have been shown to be structurally deficient. Three, U.S. highways that have suffered recent storm damage should be given priority consideration. And four, U.S. highways that are down to one lane controlled traffic and have no viable detour should be considered as a first priority funding. The result of this, of course, would be that we, last chance grade, would fit all four of these categories and therefore would be eligible for funding under the President's infrastructure program. So I'm asking that a letter be drafted, including these, to Elaine Chow, Secretary of Department of Transportation, Secretary Wilbur Ross of the Department of Commerce, Secretary Ryan Zinke of the Department of Interior, um, the U.S. Senate Committee on Environment and Public Ref 
Affairs, or excuse me, Public Works, Kevin McCarthy with the um, Congress, Bill Schuster, the Chairman of the Con uh, Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, John Duncan, Jr., the Vice President or Vice Chairman of the Committee on Transportation and of Infrastructure, Doug LaMoffa, same committee, Peter DeFazio, same committee, and Jared Hoffman. I think this is a way to be able to move the process forward for us to be able to have a chance of funding under the President's infrastructure program. And that's what I'm asking for, for this, uh, this group to support today. Thank you, Supervisor. Comments for the Supervisor? I do have a question. Um, And maybe this could be also directed to you, Supervisor Berkowitz, but maybe also CEO Serena. Um, part of the um, transportation infrastructure package or program that has been um, touted by President Trump um, during his campaign, I've heard some discussion of it post-campaign after the election. Um, where does it currently stand? as priorities, not only with Congress, but also with the President. And, and Supervisor Berkowitz, please feel free to add, when you met with the White House staff, um, did you learn at the time where that transportation funding's at? I mean, how likely is it to move forward this year? Apparently, according to Mr. Kirkland, they're in the process now of figuring out the criteria on how this is going to occur. Uh, and so, uh, though nothing has been developed at this particular time, he encouraged us to get something in there, not any kind of an earmark for last chance grade, but a broader category that could include last chance grade. What mechanism? This was the, the vehicle in which he wished to see that, or is this one that um, you guys have discussed? or? How's it been filtered sure. to, to have the most success? Sure. What well, we went in there with a discussion on how we can provide funding for last chance grade. All right. What he brought the discussion around to was you can't, he can't basically earmark any kind of funds right. for that. So it has to be worked in two ways. Number one, it has to be a proposal from the administration that, it could, that the criteria could include last chance grade, and number two, make that same kind of proposal as a congressional proposal so that we could have concurrent uh, ideas going forward uh, from the administration and from the Congress. And as you know, most of those, all those bills that are money bills originate in the House. Yes, very good. And then um, having Caltrans here last week, along with representatives from Federal Highways, did you have an opportunity to speak with Matt Schmidt concerning this? I did. Okay. And, what was his recommendation? Um, you know, I was also able to talk to uh, Federal Highways in Washington, D.C. Uh, their main complaint, of course, was they had no money. That's the complaint we've gotten, gotten all throughout the uh, uh, the times we've been talking with people there. And uh, so they say, hey, as much as we'd love to be able to build a bypass, it's just not gonna happen with the funds they have available. Uh, so by doing this and, and talking with the Mr. Schmidt, by doing this, basically what he's talking about is the studies that are going on that'll be included concluded either in February or March, where uh, they want to do a study to find out which is the cost, where it's cost effective for them to do, whether it's cost effective to keep this highway open and cutting into the hillside year after year after year, or whether they can start now talking about the bypass. Okay, so at that time, though, he didn't offer a uh, recommendation on this specific plan as outlined Correct. in the four points that you presented. Yes. Okay, so he has um, I know Caltrans, based on that discussion last week, has emphasized getting through these pieces of the environmental documents first and the geology. Um, did, did 
Matt Brady, by chance, have you, did you have a chance to speak to him about this and what he might have thought? I, I did not have a chance okay. to talk to him. And keep in mind, we're not talking about last chance grade here specifically. Correct. We're talking about things that could include last chance grade yeah. that would give us a leg up. Right. And I think what I'm hearing, and if I could kind of understand this by the speaking out loud here, so, ever, so it's all transparent for everybody. Um, Caltrans, the way the money rolls down from the federal government, Caltrans is the one who distributes that and determines how that money spread out throughout the state of California from Federal Highways Administration. Is that correct? And so with that knowledge, um, having a, a rural, specifically a rural bill, as you suggested, definitely could help in that matter. Um, and if that bill were to move forward within the Trump administration at some point with uh, congressional support, which we haven't heard a lot of rumbling of yet, but hopefully we'll hear soon. Um, what I'm going to ask, I guess, is would it be more advantageous for us to maybe flush this out a little further uh, with maybe folks from um, not necessarily federal highways, but those sitting on the Transportation Commission with Congress? to see how that would resonate before the announcement of a bill came forward, or how, how might you think that would work? Well, Federal Highways says that they can't lobby for any of this, all right, because they're part of the administration. So they can't do that. They sympathize with us, but they can't advocate. I'm not sure what that timeline is going to be for the infrastructure program, but I sure don't want to miss it. And I'm saying the earliest or the soonest that we can do this, as far as a letter is concerned, at least we're in there with something. If they roll out this program and we haven't been there, I don't know what they're going to do with it. Sure. Supervisor Cowan? I don't think a letter hurts. I mean, we all know that there is no infrastructure program right now at all. So, and we don't know if that's going to be next year, the year after, or two from there. I also know that. Um, for us to be considered, we have to be shovel ready, which we're not. That's what we're doing right now. We're taking the steps. We're doing the geological studies. Those will be completed in the spring. We're going to go into some more environmental studies that'll start as well. So I think, you know, what we're continuing to do, what we're doing on our end, to pick that chosen route, which is what they're doing. I think they've come to the conclusion that we need to bypass. It's just narrowing it down. Um, I don't think a letter hurts, but I'm not sure how much good I, you know, Bob, you got to understand that we're sending out a letter on a project that's not shovel ready yet either. But like you say, you're not naming the project, so it really doesn't hurt for us to be on the bandwagon of just some broad general funding that may or may not come down our way on a... We're, uh, we're not talking about last year, that's great. No, All right. General funding, so. Right. And we're not talking about how that funding, if it gets approved in his transportation program, how that funding is going to come down. We assume it's going to come down through Caltrans, but we don't know that for sure. So, you know, I'm saying if we can get something in there, at least we're there with something that gets us a leg up. Very good. I'd love to have a letter also before this board for us to consider. Is that something that... Um you got uh, semi-drafted at this point, or? No, I haven't drafted the letter. I'm hoping to do that with our CAO okay. and uh, the chairman. Okay, sorry. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yeah, I, I certainly don't have a, a problem with the letter, uh, um, I mean, and asking for funding. I, I'm confused on things that may include, that we're applying for, the, of things that may include just last chance grade. Um, last chance grade uh, belongs to uh, Caltrans um, and I don't know how that whole thing works and if we're asking for money just because uh, and then we may have money to fund last chance grade because they've decided to give us money I don't know what the ask is but uh, I certainly have no problem with uh, with drafting a letter uh, it's totally confusing on, on what we're asking uh, and how that all comes about. Uh, we certainly, uh, I thought the uh, information that we got at the last Caltrans meeting was was uh, certainly not uh, uh, 
not everything we'd like to hear, but getting through the environmental process looks like it's going to be four or five years. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly, I mean, if we can start working on funding now, I'm certainly all in favor of doing that. Um, as far as uh, saying that there's no money through the existing sources when you have federal highways there that does have money available and programs available. When we went back to D.C., uh, uh, there was never any indication to say, oh, don't ask for any money from us because we don't have any. So we definitely were uh, at uh, 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 different meetings, I guess. Uh, nobody said, uh, they, as a matter of fact, they uh, outlined some programs that were available for things like this. So, like I say, I have absolutely no problem with sending a letter. I just, I, I just don't think it's uh, going to be very effective if we don't, if we're not able to focus it down uh, on what we want the money for. If we're just asking for money. Well, let me let me address the four items that I would hope RCRC could support. <clears throat> I would hope CSAC could support. Specific set asides for rural counties with populations of 100,000 or less. That kind of narrows it down a little bit. Priorities for funding would be two-lane federal highways that have been shown to be structurally deficient. Sounds like last chance grade to me. U.S. highways that have suffered recent storm damage should be given priority consideration. I think that includes last chance grade. U.S. highways that are down to one-lane control traffic that have no viable detour. That's priority funding. I think that includes last chance grade. Let's assume that that funding does not become available for next year, year after, year after that. At least we're there. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, I, yeah, I heard you the first time on what you oh, okay. said that the, the funding was about, but we're applying for the funding, which is the county, and you're acting like our project is a U.S. highway. And, and so it's a little confusing on me, uh, to me on what we're asking for when there is no project um, so I mean I just don't sure. I don't have a problem sending a letter okay I, I guess it's, uh, so you just need consensus chair on sending to, a letter correct to, to draft a letter that correct. would be but brought back, come back I would okay. so and I like the idea of this um, I just think it needs to be flushed out so it has the greatest chance for success and I'd really and this is this is I think what Supervisor Hemmingson was getting at because I want Caltrans to be on board with this strategy. I guess it's, I so we know that I guess when we sat up there this last week at the table with Federal Highways, with Caltrans, with State Parks, National Parks, all the partners, which were one of the partners in wanting Last Chance Grade to move forward, I want our strategy to be supported. I guess by that partnership, and I think. Um, what you've presented here is, is a great strategy in a potential federal transportation bill to come forward in the future, which we, we don't have an idea on right now, but it could because I know it's, he's followed through on a lot of his campaign promises at this point to at least address these. We just need to know a little bit more. My, my hopes would be is that we could revisit this potentially at our next meeting with the idea that we would have some communication with our partners, maybe Supervisor Cowan, if you could contact uh, Congressman Huffman's um, office, John Driscoll, and maybe flush that out through your working group there. And if you could follow up with Caltrans, uh, Matt Brady, and see, and maybe he could have some conversation with Matthew Dory, who's the director of Caltrans, to see if this is our appropriate um, avenue and then um, lay this out for them as a potential strategy that if Delnor County were to bring these two items to RCRC and CSAC, as you suggested, to try to get those groups on board with a rural set aside and the federal transportation bill, um, how that might look and would they be supportive of it? I think going forward in that unified approach might be our best bet. Well, I think what I'd like to do is work with you so that this thing doesn't get nitpicked to death by our board. If okay. we can come together with some kind of a consensus of what we want to do here yeah. in the letter, uh, then I think we're on our way. Yeah, I, we, we just need to set ourselves up for success because for now, the past several years, we've been taking guidance from the folks that own the state highway, in this case, Caltrans, and lobbying as best we can in Washington, D.C. to advocate for our project. So this is the most important piece, and I don't want to get off track if we don't have to. 
And if this stands the most chance for success, as Supervisor Cowan and Supervisor Hemmingson said, we'll be all supportive of the bill. I just want our partners to buy in with that support. Okay. So let's, and I, I do, and we'll work with you on having those conversations with Caltrans to try to get that buy-in. Great. So um, at this time, I'd like to table this item until our next meeting and bring it back forward then that will give us time to approach the, the folks necessary to uh, bring this back to the table. And I'd like to have this item on our first meeting in October. Kylie, if you could take note of that, please. Supervisor Gitlin. I, now I am a little confused. I was very clear what Supervisor Berkowitz was asking for. Uh, first of all, I think it's going to be the first meeting in November. We're at the uh, second meeting in October now. So this will be, and I don't know if we're going to have a November 24th or 28th, 26th meeting. I don't think that's going to happen. Is that correct? We will have uh, no meeting on November 28th at this so time. So I'm, I'm not confused at all on what Supervisor Berkowitz is asking. We, I'd like to see. I'd like to see the letter in print. I'd yeah. Like to see it drafted. Hopefully at our next meeting, and then we can take a look at it. Until I actually see it with the bullet points listed, as Supervisor Berkowitz indicated, um, uh, I'd like it to be as sp specific as we can. We don't need to mention the word last chance grade, but certainly the criteria which Supervisor Berkowitz mentioned certainly includes uh, a whole a whole swath of of counties in California and throughout the country who would like to see this happen. So I can see this as really potentially being very important. And we all know the president wants to spend a trillion dollars on infrastructure. So let's put those two together and put a letter together. Hopefully at the next meeting we can, can take a look at it. Great. And, and that is exactly what has been suggested through this conversation. So we'll go ahead and table this item until our next meeting. Um, Kylie, thank you for considering that. All right. Let's go ahead and move to, oh, sorry, public comment, <laughs> please. Greg Bianchi here again. Uh, I, I think I gathered what uh, Mr. Berkowitz was saying. Uh, get Congress to know that we want something for our state highways. Have a second party standing by so when the money does get funded, if and when it does get funded, that they know that where we're trying to put that money is into last chance grade. So, Send a letter off, but if you, if, if, like he said, if you put last chance grade in that letter somewhere, they're going to say, oh, these people are still on that damn tour of last chance grade. <laughs> so take his advice, get the big boys, give them the, the letter, let them all know that there's an idea in the process, have Caltrans stand by. So when the money comes in, they can say, hey, guess what, guys? You know that idea about fixing Caltran, uh, that, that last chance grade down there? Yeah. Maybe we can push forward that money, that effort now, and get that funding done right. If nothing else, get a portion of it going, and then let's see if we can get a little more, and then get the bypass put in. But like he says, if it's cheaper to do it nickel and dime by $2 million every time that it fails, until someone has a tragic death on that road, it's like how many times did someone have to get killed at an intersection before you put a crosswalk in or put in a light? So I think the strategy works both ways. And if you guys can work it out, the details, get the big boys to sign off on it, get some interest from them, let them know about our infrastructure down here. And then you guys can have the other party standing by to when the benefit of the, of the money comes in, now we can put it to work in that in that regard so that's how i think it's coming out thank you thank you appreciate your comments public comment good afternoon good afternoon linda sutter us 101 is a federal highway we should take the last chance grade uh, name off of it 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 needs to be fixed you guys should take it into any consideration about a letter and getting on a list way ahead of before everyone else does. Now, I know you're tabling this until the next meeting, but I hope you all very much seriously think about getting a letter there because you could be the ones who decide whether you're going to hinder the project or get something done. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment. So it's, it's um, 
I'm just going to clarify a few things. Again, we want a successful strategy going forward, and we need our partners buy-in. And that's the conversation that's taken place today. It didn't say this is not a good idea. It didn't say this is a bad idea. We need buy-in. We need partnership, and it can't be done with little old Delaware County who doesn't own this transportation system. Caltrans does. And I know Supervisor Berkowitz is aware of this. He's proposed a strategy here that might address some of the issues within the federal funding bill that we will hopefully see in Washington, D.C. at some point in the near future. I know Caltrans has it us on the top of their list. I've heard this directly, as so said Supervisor Cowan, when we sat in the desk of Matthew Doherty, who's the director of Caltrans in his office this year, who said there's three things that keep him up at night. Last chance grade was one of those three things. The other two was making sure his employees make it home after a day of work and not dead. So this, these are big deals. And to be at that level with the California Department of Transportation director as a funding priority, that's a big deal. I know there's steps that we could take. We need that buy-in, especially with our small little voice. We need our partners here to stand with us. We heard that message fairly loud and clear at the meeting that Caltrans had for the community last week, and uh, we will move forward with a message. I'm not sure how it's going to look or how that letter will be crafted yet, but I know Supervisor Berkowitz and I will work together on that, and so with Supervisor Cowan and working with John Driscoll of Congressman Huffman's office to figure out some strategies on how best to craft that language. Appreciate your time and public comments on that. We're going to go ahead and move forward with item number three, which is to uh, receive brief reports from our supervisors on what they've done in the last two weeks. And uh, Supervisor Gitlin, could you please kick us off? Certainly. Thank you, Chair. Well, after our last board meeting, our, our grant school committee met and decided on recommending community block grants as you heard earlier, $250,000 each for the court appointed special advocates program benefiting abused and neglected children and the senior center. Uh, again, for $250,000 and uh, an infrastructure project on the east side of Northcrest, which again, I'm repeating because this board has approved those, uh, those grant applications. We don't have the money yet, but the, these are very competitive bids and ones which I think will benefit Del Norte County once they come in here. Uh, it looks very promising that we'll get those grants. Um, also help dedicate the new Elk Valley Rancheria roundabout uh, on South Humboldt Road uh, last week. Participated in the Great American Shakeout October 18th at 1018 a.m. at Best Maxwell School. Big thank you to Principal Dan Cartwright and all the great kids at Best Maxwell. The effort joined 8,000 others in Del Norte County, 55,000 in the state, uh, North State, North Coast, I should say, and 10.4 million across California who participated in that emergency drill on 1018 at 1018. Uh, later in the afternoon, I joined other members of our board in welcoming Deputy Wade Owen and acknowledging the signing of the Reserve Deputy Sheriff Memorandum of Understanding with the Talawadini tribe. Uh, it's with uh, great hope that this model of deputy recruitment will be the first of many to serve our county. <clears throat> uh, later in the afternoon, participated in the Chamber of Commerce Mixer at the Harrington House. Uh, met last uh, two weeks ago at the, uh, 10 days ago, excuse me, at the Pelican Bay State Prison Advisory Board meeting. Uh, 53 new correctional officers have been, have reported to their new assignments with an additional 10 more officers due November 10th, by November 10th. Current population of Pelican Bay is about 2364 and rising slightly. 313 minute, uh, inmates have been assigned to the new Level D facility, formerly was the Secured Housing Unit. Uh, perhaps some of you had an opportunity to see the Oprah Winfrey 60 Minutes report on Pelican Bay Sunday night. Uh, in there, and we'll address this, this is the annual 2016-17 recidivism report, which has been released and the rates for those returning to CDCR custody are down considerably. Uh, Pelican Bay has established lots of new programs to help inmates develop these skills necessary to stay out of trouble. And in the past, uh, I've maintained a healthy dose of skepticism about those offenders who both enter and exit CDCR custody. But I have to admit to you candidly that these important cities programs cannot be underscored. Secretary of CDCR Scott Kernan reports 90% of those incarcerated in the 34 penal institutions will be released into the communities in which they live. 
If skills and programs are not embraced, the chance of success of these individuals uh, being staying out of prison dramatically decreases. So at our November 29th California State Association of Counties meeting, that's our annual meeting, our Kern County Supervisor Leticia Perez and I will join CDCR Secretary Kernan in discussing the impact of these new programs, uh, both at Pelican Bay and at other CDCR facility institutions, among other places in Kern County. Uh, yesterday, also, the Del Norte Local Formation Commission met, and the commission was updated on the Klamath Fire Protection District and the York Tribal efforts to secure grant funding to augment fire protective service, protection services in southern Del Norte County. Uh, the commission will also be seeking applications for a new public member opening beginning in 2018. That's my report. Thank you. Supervisor Hemmingson. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I attended the uh, Klamath uh, Progressive Me Mixer, which included the Trees of Mystery, the Tour Through Tree, Klamath Jet Boats, Rukwa Inn, Steelhead Lodge, and the Redwood Hotel Casino. Uh, it was a very neat event. Uh, glad that I went. Uh, most of the other supervisors went also. Um, had a future facilities meeting, as was discussed earlier, the parking lot uh, at, down by uh, mouth of the Smith River Road. Um, as was uh, mentioned previously, uh, the Humboldt Road um, roundabout. Uh, went to that ribbon cutting and reception. Um, had a local transportation commission meeting. Uh, Border Coast Regional Airport Authority meeting uh, where we uh, decided to go with the alternative EAS uh, and use uh, Contour Airlines. Um, had a uh, Dungeons Crab Task Force conference call. Um, went to the uh, Caltrans uh, Last Chance Grade uh, presentation at the fairgrounds. Uh, got to meet, or not meet, but well actually I did meet the gentleman from uh, Federal Highways. Uh, I had never met him before. And then got to talk to uh, Cal a lot of Caltrans people as well as uh, <coughs> discussions about the road with uh, national parks and state parks. Uh, had a whale entanglement group conference call. Uh, went out to the um, Tolodini uh, Nation uh, MOU celebration. Uh, uh, that was uh, a neat deal also uh, had a conference call with our lobbyist uh, about minimization which is a term used uh, in uh, forest service issues uh, trying to get some uh, resolution to that and had a discussion with staff uh, on the Pacific Shores uh, watchman uh, program that we're trying to put out at uh, Pacific Shores uh, having issues with the Coastal Commission as well as Fish and Wildlife but I think we've got those resolved, so we're moving forward. That was it for me. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Berkowitz. Uh, Chairman, can we take uh, Supervisor Cowan? Supervisor Cowan. Okay. As mentioned, I also attended the uh, mixer down in Klamath. It was really nice. I loved what they did. I had a meeting with Ted Ward to go over um, and discuss the new contracts that we're putting together with Recology and the new recycling center down in Samoa. I also went down to Samoa and toured the recycling um, plant that uh, Recology recently purchased. It was very informative. Um, like I've said over and over again in my reports, we as a community must come together on our recycling. Um, currently in Del Norte County, we're about 18 to 25 percent in contamination. Um, the new recycling processing plant that we'd be taking our um, items to has to be below 10 percent. I'm not sure how we're going to get there so that we meet the requirements that is necessary for them to take our recycling. Um, right now at the plant, they are holding um, contamination rate is about six to eight percent. So they're at six to eight percent, we're at 18 to 25. That's a huge difference. Um, as Supervisor Hemmington mentioned, we had the airport authority meeting. We chose to go with Contour, as you also heard from Susan. And I was gonna talk about what the process is, which she already has. The grant has been sent off. We've got a little bit of a waiting period, and Pen Air is in a holding state. So we're good to go there. Oh, the other thing is, and she didn't mention it, is the foundations being poured right now as we speak for the new terminal. So that's progress. 
um, had a meeting with Rob Christensen of Senator McGuire's office. We discussed the fire south of us, the needs of the victims and the solu solutions that are currently um, being put in place. We discussed last chance grade as well as no uh, place like home. Uh, we'll have a meeting again on that this week. Um, and we also talked about the upcoming uh, town hall meeting that's here um, on Thursday evening for all of you who may want to attend at six, six o'clock. Town hall meeting with Senator McGuire, 6 p.m., Joe Hamilton. Everybody is welcome to join us there. Um, we had a solid waste authority board meeting where, again, we discussed the contracts with Recology and our concerns regarding recycling. At a visitor's bureau meeting, we went over and made changes to the RFP that's being placed and put out, uh, looking for an advertising firm to take the money that we are putting into it and to make sure it's being used correctly and most effe effectively to bring tourism back um, and bring that next new visitor back to Delnark County. I also attended the last chance grade presentation that was put on by Caltrans. Um, Jimmy um, Mattioli did a good job, I feel. It was nice uh, to see Matt Brady again, also to meet in person Matt Schmitz. I have had um, conversations with him over the phone and via email, so it was nice to put a name or face to the name. It was a good uh, uh, panel, I think, and a lot of questions were answered. I know we all have a lot of questions about what's going on. Um, what I took away is, though, we are moving forward. The fact that we are doing geological studies and moving on to do environmental studies when we still don't have a project or the funding is huge. It's a big deal. They don't normally do that. So I like the fact that we're moving forward and getting that stuff out of the way so that when we figure out the solution to the funding, um, we're ahead of the game. And in talking to Federal Highways and working with Matt Schmitz, I've never once heard them say there's, you know, there's absolutely no money. They don't know where it's coming from right now, but I completely, and all the times I've spoken to them back, you know, in the spring, again this summer, and then again um, last week, they will help us find ways. Um, I have an email from Matt that has a list of three different options. Um, I think some of them similar to what you guys talked about when you guys were in DC. Yep. It's just a matter of figuring out what's gonna work best for us and getting the buy-in and the backing and everybody working together to go forward on that. And that's it for me. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Berkowitz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gitlin and I attended a meeting of the Grants Goals Committee where we were rec recommended that this board support the grants for CASA and the Senior Center and uh, infrastructure improvements along Northcrest Drive, and I'm pleased to say that we approved all of those today. I'm pleased to report that the Klamath Chamber of Commerce hosted a very successful progressive dinner uh, and mixer. Over 50 people attended and included the ride on the uh, Trees of Mystery gondola, the reception at the legal uh, at the Steelhead Lodge visit, and uh, wine tasting at the historic Requi Inn, and a boat ride up the, uh, up the Klamath River. Uh, culminating with re refreshments at the Redwood Hotel and Casino. At a meeting with True North, where I discussed my plan to mitigate food insecurity in the outlying areas of Smith River, Gasky, and Klamath, and it was met with overwhelmingly positive response. Last week, I had a meeting with former Crescent City Mayor Rich Ania in Antioch, California, where we discussed areas where the city and the county could cooperate together. Along with other supervisors, I attended the Caltrans presentation on the repairs that are ongoing at Last Chance Grade. Last Friday, I participated in a panel discussion on KFUG radio on various topics that are covered on the daily town hall meetings, including Last Chance Grade. And yesterday, I attended the LAFCO meeting where we discussed consolidating fire services throughout the entire county. I was pleased to attend the ribbon cutting for Sand Mine Road Roundabout. It was very impressive and well attended. I was pleased to be at the Reserve Deputy Program in Smith River where the MOU was signed between Talawa Nation and the Sheriff's Department. And I also attended the Harrington House uh, uh, mixer for battered women uh, and this was of course a chamber mixer. One last comment, Mr. Chairman, at the last meeting, I made the following statement. 
It's very important to get Senator Camilla Harris support for Senate Bill 1027, a bill to extend the Secure Rural Schools and Community Self-Determination Act of 2000. It now has 23 co-sponsors. Senator Harris has not signed on to support this bill. I would hope that our board would send her a letter urging her to co-sponsor that bill. Now that was my statement from last meeting. So again, I'm asking for a second time that this board send a letter to Senator Harris to sign on as a co-sponsor of SB 1027, the bill to extend the Secure Rural Schools and Community Self-Determination Act of 2000, and I'd like to have consensus, if possible, on this request. Yeah, you're not going to need consensus. It just, it's my fault. It slipped my mind. I didn't okay. catch it. And uh, Kylie, I rely on your help on these kind of things. So if you could uh, make a note of it now so we could recall this during agenda review in a couple weeks, I'd appreciate it. And that's my report, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, uh, like everybody said on the board, it was great to see such a excellent attendance at the Klamath Chamber Mixer. Uh, they haven't seen attendance like that of a Klamath Mixer in quite some period of time from the board. It was an incredible amount of fun. Good to visit with folks and see what they're doing out there, especially in light of the efforts that the Klamath Chamber is taking towards uh, tourism marketing of their area. I attended uh, the first five families commissions meeting and we still have continued discussion around the Wonder Bus and the activities associated with funding that Wonder Bus into the future. Um, attended the Humboldt Road roundabout ribbon cutting and I appreciate Elk Valley's mention of uh, my role in that project back when I was employed by Elk Valley Rancheria to help find the two and a half million dollars essentially that funded the roundabout in that area. And it's awesome to see the first roundabout in Del Norte County. It's one of those cool things that I think uh, folks, once they get a chance to see it, use it, it'll be one of those uh, great traffic moving pieces that uh, really help convey some things and hopefully Caltrans could recognize for Highway 199 and Elk Valley Crossroads, which leads me to the point of the Del Norte Local Transportation Commission meeting, which uh, Supervisor Hemmingson had mentioned. I'm um, extremely disappointed to get a report back from Caltrans that after all the study this summer through traffic counts, through evaluation, that our Elk Valley Crossroad at Highway 199 didn't rise to a level of concern. Um, just didn't have enough cars, even during the month of July, to, to warrant a traffic project, not even a signal at that intersection. and. I know there's some ways that we could begin to look at this, as Steve Wakefield said, or Chief, uh, Chief of Fire, that's the most responded to intersection in Delnar County during a presentation he made to the Local Transportation Commission last year. And I know the Haven family, who lost a loved family member there, probably feels the same way, that there's gotta be something that we could do to encourage Caltrans to take a hard look at this intersection. It is, with disappointment, that we heard those comments from Caltrans, but it also has given us great resolve to move forward and try to find a way to work with Caltrans to get some emphasis on that intersection that a lot of folks feel they risk their life at every day. Attended a uh, food insecurity presentation by Building Healthy Communities and our Food Insecurities Working Group. Um, it was a culmination of essentially five months of interviews with families in this community that have food insecurity issues. And it was a broad-based interview and ranking process that essentially showed that there are families with limited income that do manage, but there's a lot of families here locally that don't. But it really showed that even though services were available in our community that did provide food for families, most of the time that the services that are available from agencies aren't effectively serving the families that utilize those programs. And it's caused us to take a, a heck of a look at ourselves and how we deliver those services and potentially how we can move forward. So my hopes is from those findings that building healthy communities along with our partners could really help take that next step forward in a partnership type program that will shed a lot more light on food insecurity in our home here in Delnar County and how it affects our families and more importantly our children. Attended a Smith River Neighborhood Watch meeting where we discussed some of the discussions around legalization of marijuana. 
attended a meeting with the Del Norte County Fish and Game Commission where Stafford Laird, Deputy Director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, came up here to discuss specifically elk with Del Norte County. As we alluded to earlier, um, with the fees that potentially may be assessed on our wildlife areas, this issue and discussion specifically focused on Roosevelt elk here in our backyard. And we have been lobbying very heavily, Supervisor Hemmingson and I, the California Fish and Wildlife, or Fish and Game Commission and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to get their act together on Roosevelt elk here in the state of California. It has been since 2003 that the state of California has had an outstanding revisit to the draft elk management plan. And it is absolutely unacceptable as, as was communicated by Director Bonham to us in 2014 that there's still a management plan that hasn't been revisited here in the state of California. And sometimes it's understandable why. In this case, it was a threat of a lawsuit from the Friends of Del Norte, the Center for Biological Diversity, why the department pulled back moving forward with basically an environmental impact statement for Roosevelt elk here that would allow some pressure to come off communities that are impacted by Roosevelt elk, like Donar County. However, um, they are moving forward as rapidly as they can, putting together a defensively biological sound document that'll be presented hopefully to the commission here soon in the form of a draft management plan. I know that plan hopefully will be on Director Bonham's desk soon and will be moved forward to the Fishing Gang Commission. I'm sure Supervisor Hemmingson will join me when that is eventually on their commission to help support that management plan that hopefully gives communities like ours some relief. Uh, as Supervisor Cowan mentioned, uh, Del Norte County Solid Waste Management Authority, we continue to have a great deal of discussion around recycling and contamination. I'm not sure how to resolve this issue at this time. It's been a huge con point of debate for us and not just necessarily to meet these contamination levels because recycling here impacts everybody's pocketbooks and contam contamination affects everybody's pocketbooks and potentially on garbage can sizes at a minimum or having the convenience of having a recycling center in your backyard, let's say in Smith River, so you don't have to make a 20 minute drive to town. Those are the kind of decisions that the Solid Waste Management Authority are going to have to wrestle with. And uh, I know as a poor, impoverished community and folks that come to talk to me, they like what they've got. But there's a few bad apples that are making it very tough for us to move forward with the program. And how we're going to balance that out is going to be pretty dang interesting moving forward. Attended a gender review. And as alluded to, also the um, signing, the ceremonial signing of the MOU between the Talawadini Nation, our sheriff, and the Donut Crown Board of Supervisors. It is uh, definitely a step in the right direction as all supervisors have expressed and I was glad to see everybody there. Also attended um, some discussions with uh, staff on an issue and that they may be aware of now. And then to round it off, the town hall, which I sat on a, a panel of uh, community partners to fix last chance grade. And it was great to see all the supervisors there and uh, that expressed interest will continue. And as I said at that meeting, and I'll say here now, is our job as supervisors to keep this front and center. Even though it's not our highway, we still pay for it. And we'll keep this front and center in a transparent, measurable way and hold those accountable, in this case Caltrans and those funding it like federal highways, to ensuring that this highway gets through and doing whatever it takes, including making that long plane ride to Washington, D.C. to advocate for this project. I appreciate everybody's time today. Um, sorry, Su Supervisor Hemmingson. Uh, uh, yeah. Go ahead. If I, I could just uh, request to have something uh, put on the agenda, uh, was reminded a couple of times when you start talking about solid waste authority. Um, uh, as uh, Justin uh, Caparuso said, uh, there's Environmental Services, JPA, that uh, Chair Howard is an alternate on. I think he should be removed. Um, as that and we should put on the director of solid waste authority and that that be part of his job description to go to those there may be solutions to the issues you're talking about uh, recycling all those things are discussed I've been to um, these meetings uh, and and it's not that I mind going to them it's kind of like for me it's kind of like watching paint dry <laughs> because I don't 
I don't know really what what it is that they're um, really into. I mean, I don't have all that information from you. I'm not on solid waste, um, but I think it would be very informative for the director to go and be there. I think that should. Uh, I think they pay for, to belong. I know he says the county belongs, but I think uh, I think uh, uh, the the uh, solid waste authority pays to be on that and they don't send a representative, I think they should. And I think uh, we should approve uh, at least someone that will come as staff from the, J uh, from the solid waste JPA to that uh, uh, environmental services uh, JPA meeting. It's very informative. They got a lot of information uh, and I, I'm sure it would benefit our county. Thank you, Supervisor Kiley. Then the environmental services joint powers authority for RCRC. And uh, we'll follow up with a letter on that during agenda review in a couple of weeks. And uh, final reminder, we'll have no meeting on, um, in this case, November 28, 2017, as we'll all be at the California State Association of Counties uh, meeting in Sacramento during that period of time. But we will be continuing on with our meeting on November 14th of 2017 for our uh, next board meeting and we'll see you there thank you everyone